Dear yeah, participants of the conference, dear colleagues, dear guests of the conference, greetings. Greetings for all participants of this conference. My name is Angelia Tamulevichute. I'm from the Faculty of Creative Industries at Vilnius Gediminas Technical University. Our faculty's field is communication and media literacy. So we are very happy to be a part of this conference. We are very happy uh, to discuss and to listen different presentations in this conference. And my pleasure is to moderate this conference. Uh, this spring and summer, uh, all over the world is a bit different. So it is a pity that we cannot meet alive for such a conference. But on the other hand, nevertheless, no barriers for such an important topic to discuss. So we have the ways how to gather together. We have the ways uh, how to meet together and to discuss this very important topic in the conference of the project Media Lab, uh, project dissemination to contribute to media literacy. Uh, so you already had a chance to see the online Zoom conference room, and I would like to shortly mention a few moments which are very important for our conference. So first of all, this video conference will be recorded and uh, will be public publicly available on the internet of the National Agency for Education of Lithuanian National Agency of Education. Um, who still didn't do that, we, could, we would kindly ask you to enter your first and second name uh, here on the window, Zoom window, that we could see your full name. It would be very helpful for our discussion. Uh, during all the conference, we would kindly ask to keep the microphones off all the time to keep the microphones off of course when we are speaking uh, or when we are participating in a discussion we are turning on our microphones all other time please keep the microphones muted uh, as you saw in the program we will have some short discussion and questions actually questions sec session after each presentation so if you will have some questions, uh, please be active. You can type the question into the chat room and then we will announce it. Or you can raise uh, your hand and then uh, uh, ask the question alive. The same with participation at the discussion at the very end of the conference. Um, if you have some questions, you could also uh, step in uh, with your question, uh, of course, not forgetting to turn on your microphone. Um, each presentation, uh, we will end with some questions, so with short questions, but we will try our best to keep the time and not to, not to, to have too much time. And uh, after uh, it, maybe it's more, uh, more the message is more for all our presenters, presentative presenters who for all our speakers who will present uh, as the topics. Um, I will show this card. Two minutes left to share the message and to control a bit the time uh, of the presentations. Hope. It's okay. And yeah, the last message for all of us, for all the participants yesterday with all the information you received, the Google Drive link. And we would kindly ask you to fill this information in this link because it's needed this information for the project. All of us, we participate in different projects. And we understand that such kind of information is necessary for each project. So please don't forget to, um, to fill the link 
on Google Drive link what you get yesterday. So that was the main information before the conference. And welcome once again. Welcome, and it's really a big happiness to join the conference with participants from different countries. Lots of different countries are joining the conference today. And the topic is joining us. The topic is bringing us together. The topic of the conference is bringing us together. Media Lab for Bridging Cross-Border Gaps. And for the first presentation, for the first speech, I would like to kindly invite Salomea de Piderute uh, to tell us more about the project, what are the goals of the project, and what uh, are the intellectual products of the project, uh, which were created during uh, uh, some time together with different partners of the project. So Salomea de uh, Representer from National Agency for Education in Lithuania, Deputy Head of In Service Training Division of the Department of Educational Assistance, and the Head of the Project Media Lab for Bridging Cross Border Gaps. So, dear Salomea, the floor is yours. We are looking forward to hear about the project and go. Thank you, Angela, for the invitation. And I would like to change. Uh, the screen. <laughs> Thank you. So, Rita, please take a, the picture from the screen for <laughs> improve for agency as we should do that. So, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say hello again for take part in this conference uh, for th those who are interested on media literacy. And uh, I would like a little bit uh, share more information about this project. Uh, as you see in the this first slide, there is the Erasmus Plus program project financed by Erasmus Plus program and uh, uh, it's uh, a very important uh, program for all projects in Europe and for Media Lab too. So, sorry, the main objective of the project is to develop innovative tools and measures to deal with existing cross-border gaps in media, media literacy develop and reinforce networks, increase their capacity to reach changes. So uh, we, in this project, we prepare some innovative uh, intellectual products and uh, some measures for teachers, students, and uh, youth workers. So uh, I would like to present uh, some of, of uh, these pro um, products. And uh, first is digital suite keys for learning tools for youngsters on media literacy. There are 12 online learning tools. It press presentation and uh, PowerPoint translations into partners' languages. So we translate the uh, press presentations into Lithuanian, Latvian, Russian, Polish, uh, uh, Macedonian, and Greek languages. Uh, so the, this presentation should be or could be used uh, in every country, in every school or other institutions who wo uh, which work with youngsters. So I would like to to share uh, our site uh, where those presentations and those products are presented. It's only at the moment, it's not finished at all. It's uh, some products are prepared. They are in two languages, in Lithuanian because we are coordinators and in English languages. Uh, 
Uh, we prepare three uh, video. I know that uh, will be more wider presentation about uh, this uh, uh, video which prepared in the project. It's for educational needs, those video about uh, uh, media on media literacy topic. Uh, so 12 presentations translated from, from English international language are presented here. And there are, and as I said, in all partners' languages. So you can see it here and find in our, in our site. So there are a lot of other pro um, products, but uh, uh, at the moment I would like to, to present uh, only, only presentations and a video. Uh, so for example, uh, for example, in Latvian presentation. So there are here, you can see, just a moment. Oh, so I need to admit <laughs> new participants. <laughs> so there are 12 presentations and they looks like that. It's very, very useful uh, for every teacher, every worker, youth worker uh, who interested on this topic, on media literacy, different kinds of topics, 12 topics, and uh, it uh, can use in their work too. So, So I would like to to come back to to my first screen. Just come back. Would you see it? Okay. Uh, so another uh, other uh, important product is toolkit for impact assessment. Uh, it is uh, for educators too, and there are some tools, method, questionnaires addressed to edu educating youth critical thinking through me media literacy. Uh, there are uh, 15 different measures, and every uh, youngster, every student, every even a teachers, uh, youth trainers can uh, use this, uh, this uh, to those tools. Of course, it's not uh, finished at, at all. It's not uh, designed at all, for, uh, but uh, you can use materials in the, this page. Uh, so one more very important uh, work that, will, that is almost done is, uh, uh, I would like to say, is the research. It's analysis and recommendation on existing cross-border gaps on media literacy with a very, very specific uh, focus on youth. Uh, with this analysis, uh, there are provided some recommendations for policymakers, journalists, youth workers, trainers, educators, and other practitioners. The, in this page, which I um, uh, was uh, used uh, previous, you can find this uh, draft of this analysis. It's uh, uh, still without designing, but, uh, but it's uh, finished, uh, uh, text is finished at the moment. So we, uh, we prepare six gaps. It's media trust, media industry involvement in media literacy, news consumption by youth, disinformation and fact-checking initiatives, impact of different media on youth, and media literacy in compulsory education uh, in our six project countries. So uh, I would like to present the project team. Coordinator is National Agency uh, Lithuania, is educational assistant institution founded by Ministry of Education, Sport, Science, uh, and Lithuania. Uh, 
The main mission of the agency is implementation of state preschool, pre-primary and general education policies in youth education institutions and other education providers to ensure quality of education by providing some kinds of uh, um, assistance, uh, cons consulting, informational counseling and uh, uh, other activities. Um, so, sorry, uh, project team uh, partner is uh, ZMAI from North Macedonia. It's a non-profit organization. Uh, my mission is uh, to work in field of, of media literacy, of, on journalism and uh, uh, with young uh, journalists and uh, other who is uh, interested on this uh, field. Uh, partner from Poland, Fondacja Reporterów, is a non-profit organization too, and main focus is supporting journalism in Poland and the region. So it's uh, work with uh, in field in journalism, this organization too. Media Literacy Institute from Greece is a non-profit organization too, and the work in to promote and disseminate the concept of media and information literacy in Greece and internationally. Uh, one more partner is Cyprus University of Technology, uh, which one department of this university work on communication and internet studies and uh, join with us too in this project. Partner from Latvia, Baltic Center for Media Excellence. Excellence, sorry, is a non-profit organization and hope for smart journalists in the Baltic. Uh, this uh, non-profit organization work in the field of journalism and media literacy too. So I, my mission here is to say hello and a little bit present uh, our project, why we're here, uh, what we want to do today, and uh, to present uh, widely the project and the partners. And I would like to uh, ask uh, Angele to invite uh, other partners, other lecturers, presenters to, to, to continue the conference. Thank you, Salomea. Thank you very much for introduction uh, and presenting the project. Very much important project, the topic all over the world, all over the Europe. And we are happy that uh, we have a chance to discuss these topics, to work on this project, and to create some products. Uh, yes, and we will start the presentation part. Uh, maybe just again the technical question, uh, Salomea, if you could please stop sharing the screen, then Rita could have a chance while I will be presenting the next speaker uh, to do the screenshot, the the, the prints, uh, yeah, the screen photos uh, of all participants. Again, it's necessary to have for, for reporting uh, as a project. And yes, I can see now in the screen that uh, Melina Karagiorgio is ready. Uh, and Melina will open uh, the presentation part uh, with uh, her presentation, Media Industry Involvement in the Media Literacy. We are looking forward to hear the presentation, definitely, but before that, still few moments and still few facts about uh, Melina. Everyone who is a big fan of the Eurovision, probably it will not be a first time to see Melina in screen now, because uh, Melina, she's experienced for nine years as a commentator for Eurovision Song Context as a commentator. Um, Melina has studied communication and mass studies, mass media studies. Uh, at the moment, she's a journalist and news presenter uh, specialized on the international news and European affairs. Also, Melina is a researcher and doing a very hard 
work with her research. She is a PhD student and researcher joining for two European programs around media literacy and fake news. So, dear Melina, the floor is yours. We are looking forward to hear you. Thank you, Angela, for this nice introduction. I hope I won't disappoint you. And hello to everyone from Cyprus. I wish hello. we could all be, meet in person, but uh, this is the coronavirus effect. So um, in a bit, I will start sharing my presentation, if you allow me to do so, so you can follow me with the slides. And, uh, can you see my presentation now? Nope. Not yet. Um, Not yet. Once again, she has a screen. Well, on, fr on Friday it worked perfectly. Yes, in the rehearsal. Yeah, but... Um, um, well, it's here, same as Friday and... Uh, Please, yes, she just a second, bear with yes. me just a second now. Yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Yes, but I jump to the conclusions. Let me take it up the first slide. Okay, so media industry involvement in media literacy is my topic. And before uh, presenting the data, this is a slide requested by the European Commission, which supports uh, this work but uh, does not, uh, this does not constitute an endorsement of the contents. Right. Um, so uh, what we did in this project was an analysis of cross-border gaps on media literacy. Uh, what we mean by that is uh, we tried to identify gaps in fields related to media literacy in our six countries. And by gaps, we mean weaknesses, we mean problems and differences. Um, we are six countries, we wanted to see the differences between us and share the good examples. So in the end, we, provi we provided guidelines for different stakeholders, which means the media, the educators and the policy makers. Which gaps were analyzed? Uh, Salome yeah, referred to them previously. Quickly, uh, these are the six gaps. And uh, I'm going to focus today on media involvement in media literacy. What we did in general was to collect data for each country based on literature, online sources, relevant sites, and we also did our own original uh, research. Data was uh, compared and summarized, and then we provided conclusions and recommendations. Uh, what we mean by media industry involvement in media literacy, um, we, we wanted to see what actions the media organizations like TV or radio or uh, mm -hmm. online media take to support media literacy. Is, is it part of their agenda? Do, do they dedicate time and programs to media literacy? Well, we think that information has become extremely complex, more and more complex. And, um, there is an explosion of digital media. And, and the truth is that the media industry has a growing responsibility to offer some guidance and support to their audiences. Uh, first, we took a look outside this, the six countries. We, we saw that the European Union supports initiatives for me media literacy. There's the Global Editors Network, for example, supported by the European Commission. Um, it has created a media literacy toolkit for newsrooms. Um, the toolkit included unconferences, as they're called, uh, followed by a hackathon. Uh, we also took a look at the UK example, which is, which is um, quite positive. Some high profile media have special programs for media literacy. And then we, we will move to the countries one by one by uh, alphabetical order. So first is my country, Cyprus. Um, the Radio Television Authority has a media literacy white paper. Um, it declares that um, it undertakes the task of implementing media literacy project in collaboration with public and private media. Now the public broadcaster participates by law in this, but it has no specific programs or actions dedicated to, to the cause. Um, 
we're still in Cyprus. So yes, actions in Cyprus media are, are restricted, I, I would say, in occasional initiatives. Uh, there have been some conferences, some events to promote media literacy in collaboration with European institutions. But there, there is no example of, a, of solid, declared and consistent policies related to, to media literacy by any media organization. Uh, we are moving to Greece, um, where the Educational Radio Television of Greece, a multimedia platform, um, aims at uh, complementing educational resources in the classroom. We have the Media Literacy Institute, which organizes an annual Greek Media Literacy Week, facilitated by academics and journalists. Again, uh, the MLI uh, targets in general in enlightening uh, society through different actions, uh, seminars and workshops, net uh, networking and public discussions. Let's move to Latvia, where we, we can see several projects and initiatives related to media literacy. Uh, there is, for example, Pilna Doma. It's a project by the Baltic Center for Media Excellences. Um, it uh, aims at school students. Uh, it has been running for several years uh, and it has attempted different approaches over the years. It, it has also created a database of learning tools and it has cooperated with journalists, which is quite important, I would add. Some more initiatives from Latvia. Uh, let me say that you can see more in the whole analysis. Now uh, we present some examples, uh, basic uh, initiatives, which uh, we have um, uh, found. Um, so there is a project by the Public Radio of Latvia aimed at young media consumers. Uh, there's another fact-checking project, Melo Detectors, the lie detector. It takes statements from politicians, public officials, and other public, public figures, and it makes, um, it proceeds to an analysis of uh, those statements. Next is Lithuania. Um, there is a collaboration between, between the public broadcaster and the festival. There has been uh, a collaboration for media literacy and it has created a series of educational videos related to fake news. There's also the popular news portal 15 Minutes. Uh, it's a member of the um, IFCN yeah. and it dedicates special uh, uh, space for educational purposes. Again, quickly in Lithuania, some more initiatives by private uh, media company, uh, I think it's important to note that in this case, in the Nanu case, um, journalists have, vi have visited many schools in Lithuania. Uh, so there is a collaboration between different stakeholders to familiarize students with the principles of media literacy. Um, okay, some more uh, initiatives from Lithuania. I don't want to, to, to run out of time in the end, but uh, you can also follow the slides. Um, initiatives, uh, uh, for example, such as the Debank Initiative, which unites uh, competing media outlets, journalists and volunteers for the same purpose. We can now move to North Macedonia. Uh, there is the Macedonian Institute for Media, which has um, successful projects connected to media literacy. It has involved, for example, an actor in its campaign on media literacy. And it has also produced a series of educational videos uh, uh, relating to media literacy. Another platform in North Macedonia. Um, there's the Mediateca, a TV show, which is uh, targeted uh, for children and youth. Uh, one more platform that debunks not only the single news stories, but also the whole narrative around them. So there's some deeper work uh, done here. Um, next is Poland, uh, where our research shows that few 
media outlets are involved in media literacy initiatives as such. Uh, the Polish Broadcasting Regulator has a part dedicated to media literacy on the website, but we don't know its impact. Um, on the other hand, we can see some good initiatives uh, from media groups and online sites um, for fact-checking. We can see a number of them here. Among them is uh, Reporters Foundation, or one of uh, these projects, part partners. Uh, Beata will uh, make your presentation later during the conference. Uh, and we can see some activities in general by other media. Uh, finally, to conclude, um, we could say that initiatives which uh, connect the media industry with the media literacy purposes do exist. They're usually or sometimes supported by European institutions. Um, they are, yeah, there's a mistake here. I, I was trying to write that they're not as consistent as they, as they should be, uh, and they do not appear in the vast majority of the local uh, media. So uh, as we noticed, as you probably noticed as, as well, some countries stand above other countries in terms of combating fake news and um, organizing uh, projects for media literacy. Um, in some countries, we also see an active role of the public broadcasters with, who bear their own responsibility and other popular media. And uh, speaking for my country, Cyprus, as well as Greece, I would say that we still have a long way to cover, uh, to meet the requirements of the, the standards where we should be. Some recommendations. Um, we think that the media industry has a, a serious role in guiding the population on how to recognize fake news, um, on how to um, develop crit critical thinking. Uh, there is an abundance of toolkits and case studies and which they could use. Um, also, news organizations such as news portals should build some strong collaboration with reliable fact-checking initiatives. Um, and last but not least, um, as we said, media organizations should take this responsibility and uh, dedicate their, themselves in seminars and other means in order to make media literacy a part of their programs, not just occasionally, that uh, indeed a part of the program, dedicate uh, time and resources um, and try to offer media literacy programs not only for youngsters but also for adults for the for the older ages uh, and by this I would say that I have concluded my presentation um, I would ask you what kind of initiatives you would like to see from your local media, from your local uh, industry. Um, and in case you have a good example of media industry involvement in media literacy in your country, uh, you can, I would be happy to, to hear it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Melina, for your presentation and bringing us to different countries and presenting situation. Um, would we have some questions? I was trying to follow chat. There is no questions in chat. Would we have some short questions you'd like to ask now? If not, so then, nevertheless, we are not ending with this presentation because at the very end, we will have a discussion. At the very end, we will have a general discussion. So please um, keep your questions for, for the end of the conference sure. and we definitely will come back to Melina's presented information at the end of the conference. Once again, thank you, Melina. And before presenting... Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there, is, there is a comment ah, okay. uh, in okay. the chat. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I agree on that. It says that more targeted control is needed for social media misinformation. Well, it, it's a big question, I think, um, social media regulation in general. Uh, 
th there is so much out there which is not subjected to 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 rules uh, and regulations um, uh, imposed on um, traditional media, and uh, this is the, this is a problem. Th th there is a balance between you know freedom of uh, speech and information and regulation. And uh, I think policymakers have a say on that. Yeah, we, we, I can see that Konstantin does would like to add something, please. Please switch off your mic, switch on your mic. Uh, Unmute, okay. Yeah. Can, can you hear me now? Okay. Yes, yes. Just very brief comments. I, I would like to say that uh, apart from uh, educating everyone on literacy, which is really good, and improving on that. I think it's my view that there should be more punishment for people uh, or media outlets or social media outlets that systematically misinform people on various issues, sometimes of major importance. The coronavirus is a case in point. And I think this kind of, this kind of outlets should be called out. I mean, they should be name and shame policies for people like that. And I think there's not enough of that being done. If more people are called out for misinformation, I think they would think twice about doing it again because they would lose readership, they would lose viewers, they would lose clicks. And next time they will be much more aware for the, for the need of, uh, about the need for more accuracy. And I think that public broadcasters, but also more outlets, also in the private sector, as well as educators who are related to this topic should take more initiatives towards that goal of calling people out if you don't um, if you don't point the finger then people will continue to misinform i think that's i think that's a vital point in the world of social media yeah, thank you Constantinos, for I, I i fully agree i i don't know who would punish them i mean they, they go unpunished and um so they can spread their yeah. misinformation as long as they want. Thank you. And we already jumped in with, with a short discussion. That's a very great start for the conference. But as I said before, um, longer discussions we will leave for the end of the conference. Uh, before presenting our next speakers, our next uh, uh, colleagues, I would like again to share some organizational information. I truly believe everyone we know what are strict rules are for European projects. We really need uh, for the registration, uh, the information of participants. Uh, so please uh, type your name and second name in the chat for our registration. Then we will be able to save the chat and to have uh, all the participants uh, who participated here in the list. So please don't forget to, chat, uh, to, to, to write your name and second name in the chat. And also, I still can see that there are um, participants who are not uh, uh, with a full name on their screens. Once again, you could rename uh, your Zoom name because uh, we, each of us, we have our Zoom name. So we can rename our Zoom name uh, 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 at the very top. Uh, the right top of the screen to find rename and put your name and second name on the screen as well. Sorry for this information, but we have to, we have to, this as a rule. And the last moment, the link is also in the chat. We also kindly ask you to, um, to, to fill the, the, the uh, uh, information and the link for this information is in the chat. So please, use uh, a time and uh, uh, type the information because it's really very important for our project, for this project. And yeah, the last moment. During the presentation, who is not speaking, please switch off your mics because there are still additional sounds and these additional sounds are a bit interrupting. So please don't forget to switch your mic if you are not speaking. And now it's enough about organizational information because I can see that Magla Jata and Nadezhda are ready for their presentation. So 
Nadezhda Rusetska and Maglozhata Vasilevska are ready to share some news and some very interesting information. Measuring media literacy competences among uh, 15, 15 years older, testing the methodological materials prepared by participants by this project. So it will be really very much interesting for us uh, to hear the presentation. And Nadezhda Rusetska and Maglozhata Vasilevska are teachers of English in Vilnius John Paul II Pro Gymnasium. Main field of their interest is integrating, integrating English with other subjects. That's very much important for our education system. They were involved in the project Razem dla Edukacji with partners from Poland. We do have participants here from Poland as well. Uh, so it's nice to have country meetings again. And uh, they have also been participating in some e-twinning projects such as Europe Greets Europe and learning about different cultures. Besides, last year they participated in the international projects Innovative Your Dreams and My Magic Dust, with promote, which promoted STEAM-based learning and development of 21st century skills such as collaboration, critical thinking, communication, problem solving, and creativity. So as we see, our dear teachers are very experience with international projects, with European projects, and we are very happy to hear your presentation now. Welcome. And please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We are trying to share our screen. Yeah, we hope we can see that. So the topic of the following presentation is media literacy competence among 14, 15 year olds. Uh, we are going to present the results of testing methodological materials prepared by participants of Erasmus Plus K2 project Media Lab for bridging cross-border gaps during the English, ICT and social studies integrated lessons. Okay, so let me tell you a few words about us and our school. My name is Nadezhda Rusetska and my colleague is Malgozata Vasilevska. We are both uh, senior teachers of English at uh, Vilnius John Paul II Pro Gymnasium, Lithuania. And our school represents a school of um, national minority in Lithuania. As you can see, the language of instruction in our school is Polish. Um, our school has a good practice of integrating various subjects to enhance uh, the learning in a holistic way. And uh, our students represent the age um, from 6 to 15 years. So in our presentation we would like to share our experience of working with some tools and uh, we hope to highlight the benefits and suggest uh, media education integration into school curriculum. So our presentation is uh, made of four parts. In the first part we are going to explain why we decided to get involved in media education. Uh, also, we will present some specific examples of implementation of different tools. We will try to show how we use them, to what extent, and we'll illustrate practice with examples of our students' works. Uh, next, as we're going to continue work on this project in future, we will speak a little bit about future possibilities we see in the subject integration. And finally, we will try to draw some conclusions considering usage of tool kit presented. Okay, so let us first introduce the reasons why we think uh, it is important to teach media literacy and some aspects we had to consider during our work. So as you can see, the first point is remote education. Due to coronavirus epidemic, education faced new challenges. The COVID-19 has resulted in schools shut um, all across the world. And as a result, education has changed dramatically with the distinctive rise of e-learning, whereby teaching is uh, undertaken remotely uh, on digital platforms. Another thing important is rapid technological progress. So it's essential to realize that almost everything in today's world 
relies on technologies. And when students uh, leave schools, technology will be a part of their lives for sure, and we cannot change that. And that's why inclusion of technologies into a classroom is about uh, preparing students for the world, for a future life, because it is going to be full of technologies. So um, we thought that technologies uh, are not only there to supplement the learning, but we also um, have to help students learn how to use them and how to integrate them into their lives. Uh, next point, which we um, discussed before the product, is attractiveness of issues. So um, it sometimes seems like um, teenagers' lives revolve around the phones and technologies, and adults often criticize them for overusing those technologies. So for young uh, people, um, it is common that they regard this issue as a kind of you know, forbidden fruit, which, is, uh, which makes the topic even more attractive for students. So we're talking about target language uh, learners. We worked with uh, 14 and 15 year olds. Talking about the topic, it is partly included in the curriculum of ICT in classes five and six, where students learn a bit about using media and analyzing it. However, only in seven, eight forms, students are made enough to critically evaluate and manipulate media. This is a great idea to further develop already familiar topic because between 12 and 18, students acquire the ability to think more abstractly, and this is the best time to teach them media literacy. Uh, while talking about um, uh, material, it is really appealing because students seem to feel relaxed with these materials, and this helps them to learn instead of just being tested. And it is important that material was perceived by learners as relevant, useful, because it provided great exposure to authentic language and situations from everyday life. Uh, one more thing, as English teachers, we teach um, far more than just the language. Our job is to help children become responsible citizens who care about the world around them, and it is essential that children learn that values such as tolerance and respect for fellow citizens. Uh, we should develop the key competencies such as critical thinking, collaboration, ICT competence, because these are essential skills for modern students in school, to succeed in school and in the workplace. Okay, so here you can see the list of tools we have tried out during our lessons. Uh, unfortunately, we did not have the possibility to use all 18 tools prepared by the participants of the project, first of all, due to the lack of time, but also we had to choose the tools uh, which were the best for our students, for their um, level of knowledge. As you can see, we used both materials from the toolkit, as well as training materials in the form of Prezi presentations. Uh, depending on the level of our students, we used the tools to some extent, sometimes uh, simplifying or adapting to meet the needs of the particular class. We also prepared some tasks and some tools, uh, our own tools, based on the resources given. Uh, it is important also to mention that uh, the presentations presented and prepared are translated into different uh, national languages of the project uh, partners, and thus it was possible uh, to use not only English version, but also uh, we use the Polish one, uh, which was very relevant during uh, class hours with our students. So let's move to uh, particular tools we tried out. So the first tool is KWL chart. You see the author of the tool and uh, probably a lot of people are familiar with KWL chart, which are easy to use uh, graphic organizers that help organize information before, during, and after each lesson or a unit. Um, the first thing uh, we did when using this tool uh, was brainstorm. Uh, students had to write what they already knew about the uh, topic, about media and media literacy. 
uh, and they were encouraged to use different uh, ways to uh, to show their uh, knowledge. So first of all, they, as you see, there are some uh, mind maps made in notebooks, and also they uh, used digital platforms such as Edmodo, where they had to initiate the discussion of the topic. Uh, next step, uh, we wanted uh, our students to wonder uh, what they would like to know about the topic, and uh, we asked them to uh, write uh, these questions. Uh, yes, uh, in a moment you will see them. So we've got a list of them. And uh, it was very important because this gave uh, us, the teachers, idea how to set out our teaching strategies. Uh, but also it um, gave our students um, the independence to choose their uh, own um, content of learning. Uh, later, uh, when students, uh, the final step came because uh, students experimented with the new knowledge and practiced some exam exercises, there was an L column and it showed the learning goal of each individual. Uh, students uh, made a reflection, we, uh, uh, in a moment we will see them. So uh, students, it was a really satisfying moment to see that uh, they uh, learned that it is important to know media, to avoid dangers such as disinformation, bias, and uh, they wanted, uh, they showed that they have to be skeptical. So uh, it, was, it was really good that uh, everything we did uh, really uh, developed the skill of media uh, literacy. Uh, at the end, the author uh, recommends um, to check the effectiveness of the tool, and we were really happy to see that uh, almost 98% of students uh, felt their development, and uh, they were really, uh, really confident about their knowledge of the topic. Next tool we used was the Prezi presentation, Influence of the Media on the Formation of Public Opinion. Um, as it appeared from the first part of KWL tool, our students did not know much about the media, so we used this tool as a kind of introduction to the topic. Uh, we concentrated mainly on the beginning of the presentation, so we didn't use the whole presentation. Uh, we uh, talked talked about different types of media presented and this tool was very uh, useful to introduce new vocabulary during lessons of English but it also helped students to acquire new knowledge about media and media literacy. Uh, we also tried to incorporate ICT so thus we use different online tools such as Answer Garden you can see it here to collect the uh, students knowledge what do you know what examples can we give of media? Uh, we also tried making mind maps in Kogel, where they could group the knowledge they acquired. Okay. And with reference to the questions students put in the second part of the KWL chart, we tried to find out the most powerful types of media, according to teenagers, because that was one of the questions they put. So, in a moment, you should see their answers. As you can see, the most powerful for them are the internet, television, but what is, uh, what was interesting that they also mentioned advertisements. Okay, let's move to another. Yeah, so, uh, another tool, again, was uh, con concentrated on vocabulary. This tool is a crossword, the language of media glossary of terms. And um, uh, we used it again in different ways. First of all, of course, we had to simplify it a bit. Uh, the definitions were altered and uh, adapted to the age. So, this way, a Quizlet set was created. Uh, and it helped them to develop the vocabulary they needed. Uh, and on basis of this vocabulary, they were 
supposed to uh, create some Kahoot quizzes themselves. So uh, it was uh, important again to develop uh, ICT competence as well as uh, critical thinking to choose uh, the vocabulary they needed and the concepts they cared about. Uh, another tool, uh, as, again, this crossword was used as an example how to make crosswords. Yes, and because uh, all students had to uh, use a crossword maker uh, and they themselves um, created different crosswords uh, uh, connected to the vocabulary uh, from uh, media and media literacy. Another interesting tool we presented for our students was uh, Cloud Maker Word Art. Uh, here they had to think about media and uh, they had to choose vocabulary which was important. And also here, again, they used media uh, themselves. So it was uh, another step in, in developing media literacy. Another uh, tool, next tool, is a presentation, media text analysis. So uh, in our opinion, teachers must emphasize all kinds of reading, uh, especially critical reading, which is not just reading on the lines, but reading between and beyond the lines, because we need critical readers uh, who challenge the author's assumptions, interferes, conclusions, judges the accuracy, uh, reliability, and quality of the text. That's why we thought that this topic should be worth adapting and using. Uh, we used this presentation uh, in different ways again. Uh, first of all, with younger students, we used focus version of the presentation. Uh, and during class hour, we worked on it, we talked, we discussed, they worked uh, in groups. And uh, whereas uh, on English, Hello, lesson, we again, uh, we again uh, prepared a quizlet with all the definitions a little bit simplified, but still the same as in a tool. Uh, uh, we work with vocabulary and uh, the result of this work we saw in presentations which they prepared uh, concerning the media validity analysis why do we need to analyze the text uh, the media text and how to, be, uh, how to develop their critical thinking unfortunately we didn't have enough time and we didn't finish uh, the work on media text analysis that's why we have some planned activities we want to share, uh, we are going to practice media text, uh, analysis uh, in such a way that students will have to find their own examples in press, uh, in the newspapers or in the internet. They will have to put them into the table and then we will have to analyze and find the circles of each picture uh, of the text. And another tool we used was media literacy video evaluation. Uh, I must admit that this tool was especially attractive to young learners because they spend a lot of time watching different videos and are avid users of uh, such sharing sites as YouTube, for example. And visual and auditory nature of videos appeals to, to audience and um, allows each user to process the information in a way that's natural to them. Besides during lessons of English, this tool helped to develop listening and speaking uh, skills as the students... Sorry, Sorry. Uh, we cannot probably Diana. <laughs> Sorry for this interruption. No, 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 no. Diana, Starbucks. Prašytume išsijungti visus mikrofonus.
arba Salomė jūs galėtumėt išjungti tiesiog, tai bus paprasčiau. Aš, aš galiu tik tai visus išjungti, absoliučiai iš karto. O po vieną, tai man... Užėkit ant tų, ant, tų trijų, ant tų trijų taškelių ir ten asmeniškai konkrečiai ant to žmogaus. Ir ten ne, visur būta. Mm, aš bandau susitvarkysim, gerai tvarkoju. Sorry, sorry for this interruption, but this is online thing, so uh, please, uh, please, uh, Adešda and Malgo Žasa. As I mentioned, we had the chance to develop listening and speaking skills, which was important for us as English teachers. Uh, but uh, also, apart from that, the tool really helped to develop the media literacy as the questions provided in the tool made them critically evaluate the videos. So here you can see uh, they had to answer some questions. Okay, once again, the yeah, participants, the yeah, participants. Good, okay, so can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. okay, good. So um, we also exploited uh, the resources for further project work. Okay, can you show it? Yes. And uh, students had to prepare a set of rules, how to use media. And here everyone could employ uh, their creativity and different skills. So some students made posters uh, in electronic versions, some draw posters, some prepared presentations, and uh, all results of the work show that they were really interested in the topic and uh, learned a lot. Okay, so these were all tools we wanted to present. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we were not able to test all the tools, but we can see a great potential for the usage of this toolkit at school. And uh, until uh, media education is a separate subject in schools is not uh, feasible, it has to be introduced as a component of different subjects. So we suggest that, first of all, um, should, it should be introduced as a part of language classes, both mother tongue and foreign languages, uh, where, for example, evaluating the media similarly to evaluating literature can help students develop analytical and critical thinking. Uh, we also think that um, this toolkit can be used by teachers of ICT, who are the closest to the technologies, and they will surely find useful um, materials while developing digi digital and technically based uh, competences. Uh, in history classes, students can look at how the views of history and historical events have been shaped by media. And this helps uh, such as studying films, newspapers, or even their own textbooks. Uh, and it can help students to see how nature of each medium shaped the history it is told. Uh, of course, it is simply impossible to talk about the citizenship training in modern society without reference to mass communication, as media literacy practices help strengthen students' information access, analysis, and communication skills, and build an appreciation why monitoring of the world is important. Uh, again, uh, the world of uh, work is changing, and uh, students need to be supported to develop skills in relation to their use of digital tools. Uh, also, there are some great presentations made related to journalists' work day, and it can be used to, uh, while discussing future career. So this slide, we tried to summarize uh, the valuable points of the toolkit uh, prepared by the participants of by media lab for bridging cross-border gaps and why it should be used at schools so the first point is that this toolkit can be used as a starting point for media literacy education then it is a great collection of tools for measuring media literacy competence then it is very useful to develop key competences and of course it's a great collection of materials useful in inter-subject integration. That brings our uh, 
our presentation to an end. Uh, so we probably almost exceeded our time. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, write them in chat and uh, we will surely answer them. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Nadezhda. Thank you, Malgozata. We have two comments uh, and constant Dinos, please, you have a question. Yes, I, I have added a couple of comments on the right. chat. On the chat already. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of them was that it would be useful, based on what we've heard, to consider and study a study, a new study, on how the lessons evaluate credibility, of the credibility of what they read, particularly on the internet, and how they decide what is fake and what is true. I think from what I've heard from academics and commentators here in Cyprus as well, it is vital to establish how teenagers, particularly uh, school-wise, decide what they can believe in uh, because they answered mostly that they use the internet. What criteria they have when deciding what information is credible and what not. And uh, not to forget that they are the future policy makers. So what they believe in now might be enforced in the future. That's what I want to put out there. Yeah, of course. So the, there are a lot of things to, to do while uh, working on this project with this toolkit. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the comments. And again, the same invitation to come back to questions and the discussion at the end of the conference. Thank you, Malgojata, once again. Thank you, Nadezhda, for a great presentation. The chat is also full of thanks for you, thank for you. your presentation. <laughs> Uh, okay, so um, again, with organizational information, please switch off your microphones while you are not speaking. Uh, and uh, with this very important information, technical information, um, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Maria Kazakou, the journalist from Greece. And while uh, Maria is preparing her presentation. I would like to share some small and interesting information about our dear and honored speaker. Maria Kazako, she's a journalist and the new media expert, studied communication and mass media, later earned her master in arts in quality journalism and new technologies. Uh, Maria's working experience is very wide in radio channels. Also, Maria has worked in communication offices of big organizations, also was the editorial director, and at the same time, she writes in magazines, prints, and newspapers. Maria Kazako has been teaching radio and news journalism principles in schools of journalism for the past 10 years. Also, we can recognize Maria's voice in different trailers, in commercials, as well as a European song context, Eurovision, commenting since 2006. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Again, we have some technical issues with microphone. Thank you for muting your microphone. And the final sentence presenting our new speaker, uh, yes, the Eurovision Song Context commenting since 2006 for radio and TV. And Maria presents uh, a daily morning radio show for the 24 last, last for 24 last years. So dear Maria, we are Hello. looking forward for your presentation. Uh, I can hear you. I'm sure that you can hear me, but you yes. have to allow my video because it says that uh, you have stopped it. So I'm trying to start the video if you're kind enough uh, to allow me. Uh, okay, okay. Use, for this, uh, mm -hmm. But uh, until you manage to do so, I will. Mm -hmm. I, I would uh, gladly say something. First of all, thank you all for your great work and your uh, very, very interesting presentations. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, I would like to point out a, a funny coincidence, and, uh, which is a, a fun fact as well. Melina is already laughing and smiling. Uh, Melina Karayorgu from Cyprus and I 
We are the Eurovision Song Contest commentators, Melina for the Cyprus National Broadcaster and I for the Greek National Broadcaster. Melina, it's uh, been... Uh, your, your microphone is muted already, but still... Uh, Sorry, it's, I was uh, saying it's just a, it's such a small world. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a small world. You see that people from Eurovision uh, do uh, um, work on uh, <laughs> different issues. And um, media, they're media literate. Well, <laughs> yes, we are trying to. Yeah. And uh, this is a funny coincidence and a fun fact as well. Um, I'm trying to start my video, uh, but it says that the host has stopped it. Oh, now we're fine, I think. Okay. Hello, everybody. Now, this is not only voice, it's also a face. So, after our fun fact, we uh, fast in my presentation actually because um, um, I today I do not represent the national, uh, the Greek broadcaster for which I work, but I represent MLI Media Literacy Institute, which is one of the biggest organizations here in Greece uh, working on uh, MIL issues, MIL, M I L, Media, uh, media Literacy uh, issues, and. Um, I will uh, present to you three uh, different videos, which are very short, and one toolkit, which is actually a PDF full of uh, uh, questions that you could use in order to use these videos. The uh, purpose of these videos, uh, the aim of all these videos, is to raise awareness uh, of the general public, and especially young uh, people, especially of the challenges of the uh, that new technologies uh, bring in terms of disinformation and uh, thus the necessity of um, media literacy. Now I will try to share uh, my work here. You, you can all watch it, I suppose. Eh? Okay, uh, so. Give me a second, please. So, um, the first video that uh, you will watch, we will uh, watch all together, uh, has the title Manipulation of the Future. Don't be prone to that. It's made by our friends from Poland. Uh, the second one is Media Literacy, as thought by the uh, band Fangshat, which is funny as well, from uh, the North Macedonian friends. And uh, we, have already, uh, we have also uh, prepared uh, one video, which is why do we believe fake news? This is something that we have done in MLI, Media Literacy Institute. And it uh, um, uh, describes the, um, the mechanism that people have so as to be prone to uh, uh, fake news, disinformation. Why do we believe? Uh, in uh, this information. So, um, since I am the last speaker before a break, which means that you might all be very hungry, um, I will be fast. And uh, here is the first uh, video. I hope that you will also have sound. Turn it on. No, we don't have sound. Okay. But you can switch on no, the no, sound. No, 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 no. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, okay. Give me a second. Yeah, and share the sound with us. Yes, yes, I will share computer sound, definitely. No, it's your dog. Right okay. now, you probably don't even know who I am. Allow me Do I... from the beginning. You've known it for a long time that online reality is not always what it seems to be. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Again. You've known it for a long time that online reality is not always what it's that nobody knows you're a dog. Right now, you probably don't even know who I am. Do I really look the way I look? Am I really saying what you hear? Or is it all a lie? A deep lie? A so-called deep fake? Τι ηλικία είναι? Ε, 7, 8. 7, 8. 
Es īsti nezinu. Es skatījos video par tādu neirotiku un tur uh, reāli viņš satīsa tādas sejas, kuras nevar atšķirt no reāliem. Es pat nezinu, kur es varētu to nokļūdīt. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. To help families refinance their homes, to invest in things like high-tech manufacturing. Man atrodo, ka šitas, vat, kur kampečia yra tikras, va šitas, vat, nes pasi labai judo lūpos, nes šitie tai nepataiko visiškai, man atrodo. Man tik kaip tik atrodo, šitas gyvingas, o šito jūdė seinės eina, o šito lūpos, pavyzdžiui, nepataiko ir itlo. Nu, bet kai kurios žodžius pataiko. They, they actually can all be real, I think. It's very, very well done. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. Those videos were also made for machine learning and GAN technologies. They are getting better and better. Can you imagine what they might lead to? Just think of a fake video of an influential politician saying he just started the war creepy, isn't it? So how can you spot manipulations like these? There are a few possibilities. Be cautious of things you see and hear online. Have other sources talked about it, quoted it? Who is sharing the footage? Who released it? Observe the mouth of the speaker. Observe the gestures. Do they go along with what the person is saying? Observe the eyes. Are the eyelids and pupils moving? The photos are also very realistic, but not yet perfect. Is the face symmetric? Do ears and teeth look realistic? Isn't hair growing in weird parts of the face? Isn't the background surreal? Do the clothes look okay? It's easy to be fooled on the internet, so be careful about what you trust and what you share. The manipulation of the future will be sophisticated, but you can get ready for that. Beata, thank you for the interesting. Hello, here is Beata it's me. live. It's yes, it's you. In reality, yes. very, very interesting. And uh, you, you're not deep fake, are you? You no. never know. <laughs> okay, this is a very interesting uh, video made by our friends from uh, Poland with some do's and don'ts uh, regarding the future of manipulation, especially um, uh, concentrated on uh, deep fakes. This is a video that if uh, young people watch it, they will definitely feel very um, astonished uh, by how a real deep fake can be. Uh, but they will also at the same time understand very well and very fast and quickly uh, how this technology uh, works, uh, which is artificial intelligence, because young people are much more familiarized with such technological issues and they can very easily understand how they work because, as I said, they have a, uh, a great and very fast understanding as they are technology, new technology immigrants. They are not new technology immigrants, but they were born within this technology. Now I will show you a second video. Uh, the title is Media Literacy as Thought by one music band from North Macedonia, which is very interesting and quite funny as well. Uh, you can all watch it and uh, hear it uh, properly. Huh? You have no problems with sound? Okay, perfect. So let's enjoy this as well. You, I will, after the three videos, I will present to you some um, remarks and some key questions of how we can use these videos as a teaching material, all right? We often hear the term media, but what exactly is media? If you write a message on a piece of paper, the paper is the medium. If you do the same on a tree leaf and give it to someone to read from the leaf, the leaf is the medium. The channel through which you are watching this video, it's media. Back in the days, like really back in the days, people used to draw on cave walls or send smoke signals. 
them to send a message to the people in the <coughs> near village. <coughs> media is plural from medium. It includes all communication channels we have today. It includes physical and online newspapers and magazines, television, radio, billboards, telephone, the internet, websites, social media like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat, and so on. If you know all about media, you're media literate. Let's check if our friends here are media literate. We will speak with the best Macedonian alternative band Feng Shui. Well, that's according to my opinion. Luca, the frontman of Feng Shui, will tell us what his experience with media today was. Did you use any media today? Me? Oh yes, actually I did. I posted a photo on, on Instagram and I posted a video on my private YouTube account. And anything interesting on YouTube? Ah, uh, well, actually, yes. I watched my favorite YouTuber. He posted some new video about his favorite rock bands throughout the years. That was all his opinion, to be exact. And why does he do it? Well, I think he does it because he likes to get more likes and be popular. Plus, I like him as a YouTuber because he's, like, really aware of the, like, the Ocalino. Uh, environment. Environment. Aware of the environment and all the all the climate things going on. Hey, Luca, what about you? Do you create media? I suppose I do, because everything we do with my band is allegedly mm, some kind of media. What do you do with the information you get? I check it. I check it. I check it thoroughly. 1.5 billion people are daily active users of Facebook. Since we receive so much information, we often leave room for misinformation, disinformation, or as some might call it, fake news. But how do we know whether an information is true or false? Now, let's go back to the rock band. Uh, actually, we're not a rock band. Okay, what kind of band are you? Oh, we're a free-flowing band, genre-wise. And uh, just recently we signed for a big production company here in North Macedonia. And how do I know this is true? You should begin with critical thinking, making sure that, it, that it's trustworthy. Do I know the source? Can I trust it? Yes, in this case. I know you're a famous alternative band and I have checked your website and the website of the production house to make sure. It is a reliable source. Sure. Let's say you read a headline that says the best band in the world are playing in Skopje. What do you do then? I read the whole story. Even in the most reliable sources, the headlines might be somewhat misleading. In a fake information, the writer often refers to an expert, a doctor, a scientist, but there is no name or institution that stands behind this claim. Sometimes they might refer to a real person, but the person never said this. You read somewhere that one of our songs like has 4 million hits on YouTube. Might seem legit to you, but I just think you should go and check for yourself. Thanks, guys. Hey, no problem. It was our pleasure. Media literacy is the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, create and act using all forms of communication. <coughs> Even smoke signals. Thank you for watching. Keep working on your media literacy skills and always check whether an information is true or false before sharing it with others. So that was the second uh, video that uh, we prepared for you to uh, watch in this um, presentation. And uh, now we will um, watch another one that we have uh, uh, prepared here in Greece, uh, Media Literacy Institute. And I press play. It's, this is subtitled, it's in Greek, but it is subtitled, all right? Σύμφωνα με έρευνα που διεξήχθη ανάμεσα σε εγγεγραμμένους οπαδούς του Τραμπ, το 73% εξ αυτών δήλωσε ότι οι εκδηλώσεις διαμαρτυρίας που έγιναν σε προεκλογικές συγκεντρώσεις του Τραμπ χρηματοδοτήθηκαν και οργανώθηκαν από τον δισεκατομμυριούχο Τζόρτζ Σόρος, ενώ περισσότεροι από τους μισούς πίστευαν ότι αν εκλεγόταν η δημοκρατική υποψήφιος θα εφαρμοζόταν ο μουσουλμανικός νόμος της Αρία στην πολιτεία της Καλιφόρνια. ονομάζουμε ψευδείς ειδήσει. Οι ψευδείς ειδήσει, τα fake news, είναι ιστορίες, οι οποίες παρουσιάζονται κυρίως ως δημοσιογραφικές. Είναι όμως κατασκευασμένες εσκεμένα για να εξυπηρετήσουν κάποιο σκοπό. Ψευδείς, συχνά εντυπωσιακές πληροφορίες που διαδίδονται υπό το πρόσχημα της είδηση. 
Το Πανεπιστήμιο Στάνφορντ διεξήγαγε έρευνα σε 7.800 μαθητέ και φοιτητέ σε 12 πολιτείε των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών για να διαπιστώσει την ικανότητά του να αξιολογήσουν πηγέ πληροφοριών. Οι ερευνητέ δήλωσαν σοκαρισμένοι από τη σχεδόν καθολική αδυναμία των νέων να αξιολογήσουν ακόμα και το αν μία είδηση ήταν είδηση ή καμουφλαρισμένη διαφήμιση προϊόντο ή υπηρεσία. Οι ψευδεί ειδήσει έχουν κατά 70% περισσότερε πιθανότητε να διαδοθούν από τι πραγματικέ. Ταξιδεύουν 6 με 7 φορέ γρηγορότερα. Μια ψευδή είδηση για την πολιτική ταξιδεύει 3 φορέ ταχύτερα από μια ψευδή είδηση για όποιο άλλο θέμα. Ο σκοπό τη ύπαρξη των ψευδών ειδήσεων μπορεί να είναι εμπορικό, όπω η προώθηση ενό προϊόντο ή η δημιουργία κίνηση, traffic προ μια ιστοσελίδα, τα γνωστά μα clickbait. Μπορεί να είναι όμω και πολιτικό, παραπληροφόρηση δηλαδή, διαμόρφωση κοινή γνώμη, επηρεασμό τη εκλογική συμπεριφορά. Είμαστε λοιπόν ευκολόπιστοι ή απλώ ηλίθιοι. Στην πραγματικότητα, είμαστε διανοητικά τσιγκούνιδε και προτιμούμε να αρκούμαστε στη διέστηση παρά να μπαίνουμε στη διαδικασία τη λογική ανάλυση. Προσπαθήστε να απαντήσετε στο ερώτημα Πόσα ζώα από κάθε είδο πήρε ο Μωησή στην Κιβωτό. Κι όμω, ένα στου δύο απάντησε δύο. Και όχι ότι δεν ήταν ο Μωησή ο καραβοκύρη, αλλά ο Νόε. Αυτό ονομάζεται Moses Illusion, είναι η ψευδέστηση του Μωησή. Μια αφηρημάδα βιβλικών διαστάσεων όμω που συνοψίζει την τάση που έχουμε να αποφεύγουμε τι λεπτομέρειε. Αν μάλιστα αυτό που λέει κάτι έχει οικείο και όχι δυσπρόφερτο όνομα, τόσο αυξάνονται οι πιθανότητε να τον πιστέψουμε. Αν μάλιστα η είδηση είναι δοσμένη με πολύ εύληπτο και κατανοητό τρόπο, τότε αυξάνεται η γνωστική εφράδια του ισχυρισμού. Γίνεται δηλαδή πιο πιστευτό. Αυτή η νοητική τεμπελιά εξηγεί και γιατί όσο περισσότερο προσπαθεί κάποιο να διαψεύσει μια ψευδή είδηση, τόσο ισχυροποιείται το ψέμα. Όσο περισσότερο επιχειρηματολογεί κάποιο υπέρ των εμβολίων, για παράδειγμα, Όσο περισσότερο επαναλαμβάνεται το αρχικό ψέμα, αυξάνεται η οικειότητα με αυτό που έχουμε ακούσει και η διάψευση δεν λειτουργεί καθόλου. Και τι κάνουμε. Σε μια τέτοια περίπτωση, εξηγούμε την απάτη που κρύβεται πίσω από το αντιεμβολιαστικό κίνημα. Δεν φτάνει να πούμε ότι η σελήνη δεν είναι φτιαγμένη από τυρί. Πρέπει να πούμε και ότι είναι από πέτρα. Το πώ προκλήθηκαν οι κρατήρε είναι μια άλλη υπόθεση. Σκεπτόμαστε πριν να δημοσιεύσουμε. Κάνει καλό στη δημοκρατία. So as we understand uh, the way news literacy works and uh, can uh, uh, influence people positively, I mean, has a, a great um, uh, influence to the way democracy really works. So these videos uh, can be used, uh, you, you, can have, you can all have these videos and uh, they, you can use them as an introduction to media literacy classes for uh, all ages. Uh, you can attract also the attention of the students Uh, they are addressed to both advanced students who have already some background knowledge, and I read what you already uh, see. And uh, it is a, a standalone visual message that can be also addressed to families to raise awareness, and uh, they can work uh, like um, advertisements. So uh, I have a toolkit that I will share with you in the form of a PDF. Do you want uh, me to share this um, PDF? Okay, this PDF has uh, uh, many questions that you can use before, while, and after watching such videos. What was this video about? What is media? Uh, what is fact? What's the difference between facts and opinion? Um, these are just a few uh, questions for reflection. And um, also, uh, don't hesitate to create your own videos. Try to create your own videos. You, you can understand that you don't need to be a professional so as to create uh, videos. And a very, very productive uh, way to um, uh, attract people's interests are uh, quizzes and games within uh, the classroom. You teachers know all these much better than uh, we do. So. With no further ado, uh, you can see here my URL, mariakozaku.com. Here you can find uh, my email in case you need to come in contact. And uh, here, jaj.gr uh, is the newsroom of Media Literacy Institute. And uh, I really thank you very much for your uh, time. I hope it wasn't very tiring for you. And immediately after we finish, I will share with you our PDF, which is a very, sh a very short and small toolkit with uh, questions and um, 
guidance in order to use these videos and the other videos properly. Thank you, Maria, very much for sharing this interesting and very great videos created by all the team. And also for thank you for sharing your PDF here in, in, in chat with all participants, I believe. Or I'm really going to cool. at once. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, um, I would like to offer now to have five minutes break instead of 10 minutes break to save some time and to come back to Maria's presentation and questions and small short discussions about the videos at the very end of the conference. Uh, because these videos and all these topics were presented as overlapping and bringing all our team together, so it would fit very much at the end of the conference. Uh, so let's have now five minutes break and let's meet again at uh, uh, yes, in five minutes, so 35 minutes, uh, in five minutes, so it will be uh, 2.35 p.m. in CET time. And but we cannot eat in five minutes. Uh, just prepare some water no, or coffee, <laughs> or some coffee, some water, and then you can also eat switching off the camera <laughs> and, okay. and microphones, definitely microphones. We have to save definitely. some some, uh, some minutes because we're a bit uh, late following the program. So thanks very much for the first part and let's meet in five minutes for the second part of the conference.
the time is running five minutes already away but still i can see that it's very small number of participants and more and more connecting so let's wait another few minutes to get more participants before a very interesting presentation from latvia this time Angela, can I share my screen maybe uh, in this moment? Yes, please. Yes, 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 of course you, you can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will be very clear. The coming presentation title and the speaker, very good idea. We did the break a bit shorter than indicated in the program, and the program was indicated 10 minutes. What we did, we wanted to do a bit shorter just in order to save some time. But again, we need more participants to listen to this great presentation about the new trends in media literacy teaching literacy teaching this is a very important topic for all of us for me as a, a representative of the faculty of creative industries at vilnius gediminas technical university it's uh, very important i'm looking forward for this presentation myself because it's a very we we just finished with a bachelor thesis defending the bachelor thesis and lots of our students graduates they are doing researches on on media literacy also how different social networks could be a part of a, a teaching would be a part of uh, teaching methods, methodology, and so on. So it's a good topic, really, to discuss. Thank you. Uh, I have a feeling that the trends might be similar, not only in uh, Latvia or Lithuania, but in some other countries as well. <laughs> yeah. And it's nice to hear that students are interested uh, to do their bachelor thesis on this topic. <laughs> yeah, it is really. It's an important topic to research and a bachelor's and master's thesis. Okay, I still I still very quickly check the situation with participants on phone and then I think we can start. just check the situation with organizers and we can start our second part of a conference uh, we can start 
with our second part with a very interesting presentation new trends in media literacy teaching and the conference uh, and the presentation will be presented by our latvian colleague klinta lachmele and while klinta is preparing for her presentation i would like to share some facts about our speaker as in a very nice way klinta said herself for now she is uh, one foot standing in the academic field klinta is a lecturer and researcher at the university of latvia department of communication studies and with another foot Klinta is on a very practical media literacy field, initiating, participating in, and managing national and international media literacy projects. Until October 2019, Klinta was working for almost five years in the media policy division at the Ministry of Culture of the Republic of Latvia including wrote the first Latvian media policy guidelines and organized practical media literacy activity. So we can already see what a, what a wide experience both in academic field and also in practical and in policy maker uh, in policy field. We are looking forward, Clinta, for your presentation. Thank you, Angela, for a so nice announcement. And dear colleagues, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here and share some ideas about new trends in media literacy teaching. Uh, as you already heard, my experience in media literacy field starts from policy planning till participating in practical projects. So I've collected uh, some ideas what have changed during uh, the last summer years. And um, I offer you uh, six trends uh, in new six trends in media literacy teaching and i hope that after my presentation we will have a little bit time uh, left for a short discussion whether these trends are similar in your uh, country and so the first one uh, is a wider scope i think we have um, uh, gone one step further from um, um, projects which focus on internet safety and recognition of fake news towards a more complex understanding of media routine and effects. Of course, we still have projects based on internet safety issues or how to recognize fake news, but I think it's very important that we are speaking now and discussing more conceptual issues and we make more broader this association that media literacy is not only spotting fake news, but uh, uh, under this umbrella concept, we can see some other issues like freedom of expression or why media are so important in democracy. Uh, we speak about uh, uh, stereotypes in media content and how to recognize them. Uh, also about media psychology, how do we feel when we face some content, some visual content as well, uh, as well about uh, functions of journalism, journalism ethics, uh, new trends uh, like deepfake uh, and uh, etc. The second uh, trend is different approach to media literacy teaching content creation. Uh, in first years, uh, when the first uh, media literacy projects started, uh, there were so much content which was uh, especially created uh, as a fictional news. Journalists created fake news to show audience how to debunk them and uh, how to uh, do fact checking. And I think that now uh, we have left this behind and we uh, do more uh, fact checking and educational projects based on real examples. Uh, maybe you have heard that uh, in Latvia, we have Media Support Foundation. That means that uh, media can uh, write and submit projects to get uh, support from state budget for creation of socially significant content. And one of these categories is devoted to media literacy and debunking fake news. And here on the right side, you can see two uh, projects. Uh, one uh, is uh, from a commercial news portal and uh, is named Do Not Believe uh, in Tales on the Internet. And the second 
second one is from uh, one of the most popular commercial radio station, SVH, uh, which broadcasted uh, uh, news uh, articles, uh, moderator read them, and then said, no, 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 uh, it's fake news, uh, you shouldn't believe that, uh, and uh, you have to uh, check information in that or this uh, way. Uh, so you can see that uh, these uh, articles were uh, made fake intentionally by journalists, and uh, I think it's important that we are in another, another step and uh, use more uh, real um, examples. The third trend uh, is related to effectiveness measurement uh, of media literacy. Uh, when some years ago we started first uh, media literacy development projects in Latvia, we had a little funding and of course the most important thing was to implement this project and we were not so uh, engaged in uh, measurement of uh, effectivity of them and I think that now uh, the situation is changed and uh, now we uh, even have detailed measurement before and after learnings, uh, even after five hour media literacy learning program. And I think uh, this uh, shift uh, in trend is uh, related with international uh, funding from embassies, from international NGOs. Uh, when they invest money uh, in uh, the situation in, in Latvia, they uh, really want to get statistics approval that the money and projects implemented by it uh, has made some uh, impact and uh, influence in uh, media literacy of uh, target audience of this project and I will take time and do a little advertisement that within this project uh, me and uh, my colleague Olga from Latvia also made media literacy measurement tools for me it's a situation test and uh, according to them as far as I understand it uh, will be available uh, very uh, soon. The fourth uh, trend uh, is wider scope of methods, not only uh, in uh, topics we go in wider field, but as well uh, in uh, usage of various methods, you can see some of them. Uh, also, uh, we saw uh, very wonderful videos uh, our colleagues demonstrated today, and uh, I just wanted to say some words about uh, the uh, second picture. Uh, it's a screenshot from the animated campaign uh, devoted to five to eight years old children named superheroes on the internet with aimed to develop media literacy and uh, internet safety for children. Uh, I'm uh, the co-author of uh, it and uh, I'm proud that uh, the last year it was announced as uh, one of top 10 uh, projects out of 130 projects which were submitted to European Media Literacy Award the last uh, year. So uh, animated campaigns also we have in Latvia and I will show uh, one example about fiction book. It's a very nice uh, tale uh, written by a uh, PhD in communication, Solvita Denisa Lietniete, about uh, the wolf manipulator. Uh, this uh, book is uh, addressed to nine till 11 years uh, old uh, and in a very uh, amusing way uh, tells about wolf who is doing uh, manipulations in the uh, internet uh, and uh, in such, such a way with help of this fictional story uh, helps children to understand understand uh, what can be the pitfalls uh, on the digital uh, environment and how to help themselves not to fall in, uh, into them. So the fifth trend, uh, I think uh, we have to mention teaching media literacy digitally and uh, our colleagues Nadezhda and Malgajata from Vilnius are already excellent, uh, explained and showed wide variety uh, of the digital tools which can be used uh, teaching media literacy in a digital way. But uh, I will comment a little bit uh, on the second row of this uh, slide. Uh, I will add uh, that Padlet.com, uh, maybe you are familiar already with this tool is really great uh, way how to collect uh, students uh, responses it can be used like a, a whiteboard where everyone can write their uh, thoughts and we can see them uh, on the screen uh, the next is drawing manually and probably uh, someone of you might ask uh, why do we speak about drawing manually when uh, there is a slide about teaching media literacy digitally that's because we know that zooming is quite exhaustive isn't it uh, and 
and students, uh, in my experience, uh, are really happy then when they have a possibility to do something manually with paper and pen. Uh, for example, uh, I give five minutes to them to draw themselves, draw uh, people, uh, and uh, write down all the stereotypes that might be associated with uh, him or herself. For example, status as a student or a pen uh, or a, a hair color, for example, blonde hair and etc. And it can be a good base for further uh, discussions about uh, uh, spotting stereotypes in media content. Uh, so drawing manually also uh, can be used uh, when we teach media literacy digitally. And the last one, but not the least, uh, I would like to focus uh, on uh, fact checking uh, sites a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, it's very hard to uh, sparkle interest in uh, high schoolers and uh, undergraduate students uh, with some articles which are uh, very hard political uh, debunking the fake news and etc. Uh, instead, uh, I tend to use uh, some fact-checking sites uh, which use uh, a soft content but uh, still can uh, teach some methods can, uh, how fact-checking uh, can be uh, carried out. Uh, for example, uh, there is such a site like snobs.com. Maybe you know uh, there is available uh, printed content as well uh, videos and photographies uh, which are fake and some of them are not fake and uh, you can discuss with students uh, um, how uh, this information whether it's true or not uh, can be uh, verified and as well uh, in the United States there is uh, such a site uh, gossip cop uh, that uh, means uh, that they do research on uh, gossips uh, on uh, uh, Hollywood stars and uh, world world celebrities like for example there was a piece of news that uh, Queen Elizabeth from United Kingdom is stepping down and uh, this uh, fact-checking site uh, explained why this fake news appeared, how it was uh, disseminated and how to uh, check uh, facts and uh, information. So by using this soft content which might be uh, more of the interest of students, uh, we can uh, show uh, methods uh, and ways uh, how we can uh, verify uh, information in our uh, daily lives. And so the last one uh, is uh, not uh, a trend yet, but I would love to see it uh, as a trend. And it's a challenge for the future how to work on media literacy, educational content uh, reuse, uh, reuse. And uh, here I even use this recycling symbol. Uh, and I strongly uh, agree with uh, famous professor David Buckingham from United Kingdom. Uh, he, in the last autumn in the conference in Helsinki, mentioned that we have dozens of dyed uh, media literacy projects and dozens of dyed media literacy pages and uh, some of them are still trendy some of them are very valuable but uh, since the project is finished uh, there is no more uh, interest and these pages are not um, uh, how to say uh, put in a, a flow anymore and uh, this uh, issue was concerning uh, European Commission as well and the last year they were offering the that uh, all member states uh, should send the materials which are, are elaborated in each uh, state uh, and uh, European Commission could make a repository uh, but uh, this good idea of course faced some uh, obstacles and raised uh, questions uh, for example for which funding uh, there will be a translation done for the annotations of this project if we just publish this project in our original languages uh, do they really um, uh, will sparkle some interest uh, in uh, member members uh, of uh, other states uh, so uh, I tried to find more information uh, how far this uh, initiative was for European Commission uh, has uh, um, has uh, been uh, uh, gone uh, but uh, I didn't um, succeed uh, if you have any more information then please uh, share it with me and I think that uh, one practical thing what we can do to solve uh, this situation is when we do teacher uh, training or when we train trainers of trainers like uh, youngsters, uh, we can include these materials in uh, our uh, teaching problem uh, program and uh, remind about uh, them, uh, thus uh, helping uh, them not to uh, become forgotten and not to become uh, yet uh, another dyed media literacy project page. Uh, of course, it's very, very important to find new methodologies to cover new topics and go a step further, but it's what nurse, it, it is worse uh, not 
not to uh, forget all these good materials uh, with what uh, we have uh, already uh, made. Uh, so uh, that's very shortly. Uh, that's all from my side, and uh, I'm uh, waiting for your questions uh, for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Klinta, very much for bringing us to media literacy teaching. Uh, very important topics. And now the floor is open for questions. So please, someone, if you have some questions, welcome. Constantinos, please. Um, just, a, just a question on all the presentations in general that I, I've been thinking about as well. Um, as well as looking outwards, I think we should also look inwards towards the journalistic profession uh, because it has not been established as a profession in many countries and people that do not have uh, good background education or are not aware of the issues themselves become journalists. So they become the source of misinformation just because they are also ignorant or are not aware of the issues. Uh, so I think that we should devote some time in establishing journalism as a profession in many countries that does, still does not exist and take the time to consider uh, journalists that um, are not educated enough to provide accurate information and make sure that uh, people who are in the profession are themselves aware of misinformation and fake news and do not actually spread them themselves? That's just a question out there for everyone. Yes, uh, thank you so much for your remark. Uh, I will just mention that uh, I think it's uh, very useful to think about journalists' lifelong learning. Uh, I have uh, given uh, a lot of interviews, uh, especially when I worked in Ministry of Culture. I had uh, at least uh, three or, or more interviews every week on uh, media literacy issues. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, from the journalists, especially those ones who come from regional outlets, uh, these questions were not going for further than uh, just uh, have to spot fake news, uh, please mention five signs of the disinformation uh, and etc. That's why I think we need to educate journalists as well, just to give them uh, more uh, background knowledge and prepare for asking uh, more uh, sophisticated uh, questions as well. Yeah, thank you. Do we have uh, some more comments or questions, particular to Clinton's presentation because of the strict, very strict schedule, probably Clinton will have to leave um, if we will be a bit late. Yeah. So if you have some questions, please use the time to share the question now with Clinton and we can have a short discussion. If not, Clinton shared her email. Yeah. Yeah. Linda shared her email and if we um, if we have um, moments or things or ideas to discuss, please let this conference will not finish our discussion. Let this conference will be just uh, the good uh, basement for our discussions in the future. Thank you very much, Clinda, for your presentation. And now, uh, before again presenting uh, Jovana's presentation, I can see Jovana is ready. Um, again, I would like to share the same organizational information. Um, please um, don't forget to, to reg for registration to type your name. You already typed a lot of names, so thank you very much. And also, please uh, fill the link this additional questionnaire with additional information. Thank you very much. It's important for the project. Jovana. Um, hello. <laughs> hello. Hello. Uh, and like in Eurovision says from, yeah, hello from North Lithuania. No, from North Macedonia. Macedonia <laughs> yeah. And Jovana, yes, yes. uh, Jovana Avramovska, uh, she's ready to present us uh, how to educate the audience on media literacy without using the words media literacy. It's interesting already, yeah? Yeah, a good, good, good title. Um, we'll see, I'll try. Yeah. 
and before, and while Jovanna is uh, preparing for her presentation, my pleasure is, is to share a few facts about uh, Jovanna. Uh, so Jovanna is a media and public relations profession, I would say worker, yeah, professional. For the last eight years, Joanna has been working in the media and PR industry. Starting as a journalist uh, on the morning show where she works for the three years, to the current production role in Yesterday News, a newcast like sarcastic comedy show, Joanna's first love is media. In between, she works as a public relations professional for the Ministry of Finance. In the last three years, Jovanna has been working on several media literacy campaigns. The most successful ones were part of the fifth and last season of the show Yesterday's News and the project Media Lab for Bringing Cross-Border Gaps. So we can see uh, the huge experience in the field of journalism and media. And we are looking forward to hear your presentation, dear Yovana. Hello, everyone. Um, huge, I wouldn't say huge because I'm still young. I believe there are a lot of people that more experienced than me probably listening to this presentation. But what we have done and successfully in our country is um, sort of uh, incorporating media literacy lessons into our show which is a, a sarcastic comedy show it's newscast like sarcastic comedy show if you've watched the daily show or something like that you probably know what type of show we're talking about uh, i will play you a few short videos just to see what i'm talking about a bit later so i will start presenting tell me if you're seeing the presentation okay because i want to make it full screen Wait a second. Okay, are you okay with this? Probably. Uh, so I will start with uh, the media literacy and its cross because I do believe that uh, we should not use the term media literacy in order for us to explain uh, some of its concepts. And I think that it can be uh, counterproductive in um, some cases when people are not willing and ready to start learning something new again. Uh, I will ask the professors to here in the audience to sort of uh, be nice on me since I do believe that you are now the best presenters there are when it comes to online teaching. But I will try to explain uh, how we can actually make the teaching more fun. So I do believe there are three main things to keep in mind. One is to talk about examples rather than definitions. Uh, the campaigns that we do on media literacy, if it's a campaign or the lessons we do on media literacy, need to be made fun since uh, the younger audiences especially are used to this kind of fun and interesting uh, things that they're getting on the internet and we need to sort of fight uh, on that uh, level. And the last is to use local channels to deliver a very global message, which is uh, how do we become more media literate in a digital time when we are sort of um, overrun by the media and everybody who is saying they're journalists but they're not and everybody who is trying to create news. So um, I would start by talking, to, uh, talking about examples and I will show you a few examples that you can use in class to make it uh, more fun and more clear to students of different ages on how this works. So one of the platforms that I also use during our projects training in Skopje, it's Break Your Own News. It's funny how easy it is to make um, news-like shows. I don't know, are you, are everybody seeing this, Angela? Yeah, all is good. Yeah, okay. Good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I don't know, give me a headline. We can see the presentation itself. Can you see my, my uh, screen? 
No. Probably the presentation, not. your presentation, your presentation. Okay. I yeah. will click a new share and. Oh, okay. We'll... It should... Yeah, screen. Share. Now? Yeah. Till your presentation. It's again yeah, my now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, I'm trying to create some kind of uh, news here, which is an example that can be used uh, in class to show the uh, students or show the audiences if you're using other platforms, how easy it is to create a news. So this is a great conference is the headline. Latvia's team was great. Probably the journalists here have more fun headlines to give uh, this. And then you choose file, just any file, for a photo. I don't know why I have so many bees here, but I will choose one. This definitely makes no sense, but you get my idea. You can create uh, a headline and something that looks like news very fast. This is a meme creator, so it's usually used for fun. But this next one that I'm going to show you, it's much more sophisticated. It's called Groover and it's a platform that sort of um, helps you uh, use uh, artificial intelligence to create news. So all you have to do, like you don't even need a journalist, you don't need anything really uh, to create your own news and sort of start uh, a news looking like discussion online. Let's say today it's the 30th of June. Come on. So, sorry. 13th of June, 2020. Uh, okay, we will have the New York Times because why not? And you just put the outer here. It can be me. Probably it won't be me, it will be a fake. Uh, Gen genetically sounding name uh, and let's give it a headline um, um, sorry and just click generate and it will generate news for you. You, you should wait a bit, <laughs> but you will see how, how fast it actually does. Maybe my, so I will, while we're waiting for this news, I will explain what it does. Um, here it is, so this is it. A news has been created. It sort of scrapes all the information from the internet. It combines it into something that sounds and looks like real news. It gives you your headline, the one that you wanted, and it makes it sound like a news uh, piece. And if you read through it, it's pretty logical. And I must say, because I presented this uh, in my training before, it has gone so far for six months. It does so much better when it comes to creating fake news. Um, automatically without actually any work needed to be done just in like a few minutes as you saw you can just publish anything you want to and it's very important for the students or the general public to know this in order for them to sort of check the source check if the author really exists if the author really said that etc but i think that this is a very good example of how it can be done um, I will go back to my presentation now and just explain uh, a few more things. I also want to uh, say that it's very important to talk through examples uh, like I just did, but in general during the training here and during uh, the presentation even now from Latvia, and I believe Batas will be like that as well, uh, we saw a lot of examples of what's going on in the world, of uh, what's happening, etc., etc. And I think that this is the type of thing that sticks into people's minds or so far this has proven right since that's what we're doing in the show and that's what um, most of the good teachers are doing when they're teaching in definitions they give you an example first 
So the next one is, as I said, we should cross the world, uh, the word media literacy, and um, we should do more of um, dialogue placements. We did this by creating a situation in which a, per, a person usually finds themselves during uh, their lives uh, and I don't know, situations in which uh, journalists are found or how something can seem right but cannot be. And I will also uh, share some of the um, findings that we have there too. I hope you're seeing my screen. I was not sure how this will work on um, Zoom, but I was sure that you will be happy to see some browser uh, work done. <laughs> okay, so the first one, it's called, um, I think all of you remember the scam with the Prince of Persia that is scamming people to pay money to his account and then get some back. So we had it in our show and we had uh, like a piece where we work in a journalistic like uh, environment and this is our boss uh, with uh, her documents. And then the handyman um, working there uh, was very happy to hear some news. I will play it. Sorry, do you hear it? Do you no, hear? We can, no, we can. Okay. We can only see. You can share the sound with us. Share I will. Sound. Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Just a second. Oh, this. Can, I think not in this window. You can go. You can go to view options. Just a second. And then it should be. Um, can, you, can you see that sheer computer sound? Yeah, it's just a problem with my. Okay. Oh, okay. I. Um, no. It's in the very top where you can, uh, the very, very top. There are, you can just click on. No, we cannot hear yet. Can you, can you, can you see where to, to do changes? No, we can hear now, no? Do you hear it? No, not now. Okay, let me try one more time. Okay, let's try one more time. I knew this was happening, but now? Yeah, we can hear. We can hear. Mm -hmm. So that's it. That's how much Macedonian you'll get uh, for today. <laughs> I mean, you'll get a bit more, but I will just explain to you what's happening here. He says goodbye poverty, which is a saying in our country, unfortunately. And uh, what he wants to say is that he is going to get uh, 100,000 from a certain prince if he only puts uh, $100 uh, to his account. This was a very famous scam from a few years ago. Then his boss comes up and asks, why are you so happy? And he explains that he's getting money. But in the end, we actually, after a bit of comical discussion, we actually see that this colleague here on the left with the mask, that she's actually taking everybody's money because she can. And then luckily she gave him the money back. But in general, we want to teach the audience that you should not give your data to everyone. Uh, okay, I will play you a few more videos. I know that it's a problem now with the audio, but um, I will still try to because I think it's important for you to see and some of them are important for the journalists here as well. Uh, let me see, leave computer audio. It should be okay now. The next one is this one.
this man is trying to bribe the journalists uh, in order for them to write a certain story that was interesting at the time on his behalf and to sort of spare him while black mounting somebody else, which we all know it's happening uh, even to the best uh, sometimes. But in general, general, we wanted to show that it's important if you go deep enough into a new space to see this part. Sorry? No, it was just interruption. It's okay. Yes, okay. We only can see the view, but we cannot hear. You but cannot we, hear? No, we cannot hear. Okay. But you were shortly intro introduced already, yeah? Now, you can. <laughs> So you're probably getting the idea here. Um, I, I'm not sure, but it's actually a story about somebody trying to, it's a comedy show, but we did a campaign throughout the show to sort of prove some points. And this is sort of like a shout out in a Western style to professional journalists that do not take bribe. Uh, which we're very proud of as a campaign uh, in order for us to sort of direct the audiences to those who actually do proper journalism. And I will play you one more and then that's it from the videos. Okay, so the point in the last one here, obviously, was to prove that not everybody wearing white is a doctor and not everybody that looks like an expert on the internet is in fact that. Um, okay, I was freezed for a while trying to show too many videos, I guess. <laughs> Just a second. Okay. Angela, help me out here. <laughs> yeah, so something is that. Um, but we, but, but we have already to approach a bit to the end. Two minutes left for 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 the presentation. So of course, of course, yes. Uh, I'm okay. Here it is. Yeah. So what I wanted to say is, we use this kind of narrative to share a message with uh, a serious audience that we have. The audience is between. 24 and 34 years old and we already had a page with a reach of over 600,000 people. Some of these videos on Facebook, most of our audience is on Facebook. We also go uh, on the second most watched channel in the country, but uh, our Facebook audience responded very well to these messages and we do believe that it will make an impact since we did see that in the comments. Um, so the last one connected with both this and the videos that we did during this project, it's um, to use local content and local channels to deliver a global message. The global message, of course, is connected with everything we know about media literacy, how to share it with the audiences in order for us to make them more media literate. 
uh, but the, we need local channels or we need to make sure that we're delivering this uh, in a good way to our local audiences. And as you saw, like maybe you didn't find the show extremely interesting, you could not understand what's going on, etc. but it was very well accepted by the local audience. So I think that we should work together in bridging the gaps when it comes to knowledge while using a sort of local tools to do it. And this is also what I found to work for the videos uh, from our project. I think that uh, the Greek team shared them, so I will not reshare them, of course. But the fun thing is that when youth were seeing this in each representative country, the sort of felt related to the video from that country the most. In the first one, you see youth from different countries uh, delivering almost the same uh, message and uh, they voted for this video. Uh, in my country, they voted for uh, the Macedonian video the most and the last one, the Greek one, which is in Greek, probably worked best with the Greek audience and uh, the Greek audience in Cyprus as well. So uh, I really think that it's important to sort of localize our content if we want to have a success. And I think we did so by creating these uh, videos as well. So this is it from me, unless there are some type of questions that you have. I can stop sharing my screen now because it has been quite a wild ride, but I hope you all got the idea and you're not bored during this uh, Googling of mine. <laughs> Thank you, Yovana. We, yes, of course, we did get the idea about uh, the media literacy that we can learn and we can know without using these words, yeah? Um, and also, coming back to the video, you, you, your team created and uh, what was presented already by the Greek colleagues. It's really amazing video and very good video, so thank you very much for bringing back us here to this moment as well so thank you now, I will share the sorry I will share the links with everyone uh, for some of the platforms etc that I hope they will find useful like uh, maybe use during lectures or during some campaigns yeah great especially your your tools and you will already see in the chat so many participants are happy uh, about your presented tools and 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 thank you very much for sharing with us really it's a great tool for our classes for working with young people for media okay. literacy thank you thank you for having me okay so and now uh, do we have short questions to Jovanna directly to the topic and to the to her presentation or we can leave it to the final discussion Let's leave it for the final discussion after the conference. Um, and now, uh, yes, approaching uh, uh, the end, and very uh, often we can hear in such moments, last but not least, yeah? And Beata already had a chance to wave us uh, for all participants um, uh, before, during other presentations. Uh, and now the time to hear Beata Biel presentation from Poland. Uh, what have we learned from the 19 pandemic in terms of disinformation and media literacy? Yeah, so very uh, nowadays topic. And while uh, Beata is preparing uh, her uh, screen share, I would love to share some few facts about Beata uh, Biel. So Beata has been working in the media industry since 2001, so great expertise. She worked as a journalist and editor for leading investigative program and was also a documentary filmmaker. Beata also led Google News Lab efforts in Central and Eastern Europe. Currently, Beata leads a fact-checking platform, Concrete24, and acts as a media trainer for Reporters Foundation in Poland. So again, short presentation uh, opens and presents Beata's expertise in the field of media industry and Beata we are looking forward for your presentation yes uh, can you see it I'm not sure if it's available 
for yes we can we can see already okay so uh, I'm very happy to uh, be here and uh, who you saw that was indeed me that was not a fake Beata it was me from my own room which is currently my own newsroom because we're still working in a distant uh, remote uh, work and I will today focus a bit on uh, disinformation during the pandemic and what we have learned about media literacy and disinformation during this really rough time. And uh, since, as I was introduced, I'm um, leading the efforts for education in Fundacja, but also leading a fact-checking platform, I have to say that it has been a really, really challenging time. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, we had a lot of uh, challenges we had to face that we have not known before uh, we joined before the, the coronavirus started uh, and actually we have observed uh, how the pandemic was changing that meant also we were observing how the disinformation campaigns were changing so i will talk briefly about that because it's a new lesson we didn't have um, we tested for maybe quite the first time we tested our media literacy skills and digital skills uh, in real battle. So, you know, we're all teaching digital natives, we're teaching kids, we're working with youth, uh, we're teaching adults how to behave online and what digital, digital skills are. And this was the time that we could test them. And in my own view, I would really love to hear from you how you see it. From my view, quite a number of things did not work. But let me just start um, a few words. This is the word, one of the words that we're creating during this pandemic time. So a new word that has not been used very much before, uh, it's the infodemic. So the word that is connecting the information and pandemic. So this is the time we, we are leaving for, we have been living in uh, for the past couple of months with the overflow of information, true and fake, uh, about this uh, uh, this disease, this virus, and it influenced the way we perce perceived information, the places that where we perceive the information, and it's changed also the fake news uh, uh, um, sphere. Uh, if you if we think about this information as such, what we have observed, uh, I'm talking about the Polish example because I'm based here in Poland, but it's not just Poland. This is what has been discussed among many fact-checking platforms and many fact-checking experts, how this, in, this information has been spreading and changing. So if we go back to January, uh, uh, if we go back to January, which has not been that long ago, but do we still remember what the disinformation was back then? So we still heard about coronavirus about as being this challenging and quite terrible virus spreading across China. It was distant information. It was in a way for most of the of, of societies, we did not consider it as uh, something that might be affecting uh, us uh, in our own countries. And what we were receiving uh, from China, here are a couple of examples. It was very popular videos and photos from China of people lying in the streets, presumably dead, or people going to the post office before there was a lockdown in China and in Wuhan, and people were just fainting in the streets, presumably from coronavirus, from very high temperatures. So it all looked very mysterious. Uh, what we were also getting was photos and videos from different markets, um, the so-called wet markets where animals are being sold, lots of different animals, uh, cats, dogs, uh, some of them for eating, so a different culture. Uh, this was being shared as uh, the place where coronavirus is spreading from and lots of photos that were coming were actually not from China. And the video, the photos of people fainting or dying uh, in the streets, those were all fake uh, and not and uh, coming from movies or being fake and many of them were just like satire movies not even from the current time but filmed many many months or years before the third photo that you see here it's in polish and it's a story of 
uh, three kids uh, dying uh, in a hospital in Wuhan. And the narrative was, the word is, China is hiding from us the real scope of the pandemic, or, or back then epidemic, uh, because they're saying that kids are not dying from, uh, uh, from coronavirus. And here is the proof those kids died from coronavirus. Here's the video. In reality, the video was indeed from Wuhan or from a region nearby, but it did not present kids that died from coronavirus, but from, uh, uh, from, um, from uh, uh, I forgot the word in English, uh, but th this was not, not related in any way uh, with the pandemic. It was caused by a failure in the building uh, and they died from, uh, from carbon monoxide. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. So totally different, uh, different stories. But what they were building in our societies, although so distant from Wuhan, was the, the feeling that it's a distant story, but it's not affecting us because it's there in China. But the, it was building in our Western societies the fear. The fear that it might be coming to Europe and that we know so little about this disease and about this virus because China, as a non-democratic country, is hiding information from us. So the beginning of this disinformation campaigns were very closely related to building the atmosphere of fear. What also was noticed, and it was already researched by some American companies, is that um, lots of disinformation was connected to building hate towards China and the Chinese citizens. So what it was meant to be was to um, to build uh, hatred or disguise, disgust um, or despise to the Chinese and uh, overall uh, Asian culture. You know, they are eating bats, they are eating cats. Uh, those are known like non-civilized ways of living. So this is the first part of the disinformation campaign that was coming here to Europe or to Western world. And I would say that largely it was focused on building hate towards China and Chinese culture and building fear in our societies because lots of the information that was also coming here could not be verified. It's not because we don't have skills, it's just we don't have resources in China. China is the closed society. Um, lots of websites are blocked. They cannot use Twitter. They cannot use Google, at least officially. So lots of information that was coming here could hardly be verified. So for that, um, in the Western society, it was like building mistrust towards China. And lots of questions were coming. Who, uh, who, is it, who is responsible for the disease? Who, uh, who started coronavirus and who created it? Maybe it was the Chinese who created it in their laboratories, or maybe it was the Americans who created it but then sent it to, to China. So geopolitically, it was a big disinformation campaign. Who was standing behind it? Well, we don't really know. Lots of different opinions were created for that. Uh, it was uh, some were saying it was the Americans, some were saying it was the Chinese, but also uh, the rumor was saying it was the Russians. But of course, as of yet, it was not um, as of, it was not uh, confirmed. Then, uh, when coronavirus started coming to Europe, and let's focus on Europe here. So at first, Italy, uh, then uh, then uh, uh, Spain, and rest of the uh, and the rest of the world. Uh, and so, um, uh, what started was different uh, disinformation campaign focused on healthcare. So um, people were uh, thinking about how to treat coronavirus, how to, what kind of ways uh, are available for treatment. So you could see here is just uh, uh, one of the examples for how you can treat coronavirus with vitamin, vitamin C. You can treat it with garlic. You can treat it with drinking alcohol. Lots of different tips on how you can uh, take care of the virus and what you can do. And this one was probably not organized, not organized this information campaign. But very often, for the fear of getting uh, sick with it, people were 
trying to find uh, ways of how to deal with it. And they were just sharing, um, uh, sharing uh, their own tips, which were growing into some bigger news stories. Maybe not news stories, but Twitter or Facebook stories. Vitamin C, C though, is a big disinformation campaign going on for a longer time. It's not just the vitamin C, it's not just su suggested to be used for um, treating coronavirus, but for treating cancer and so on. There is no proof uh, showing that coron uh, vitamin C can treat cancer or that it can cr treat coronavirus, but obviously it can keep uh, your immunity better. So the second part was this, and I think this was the, the most um, scary one. So the one that affected I guess most of the people around the world, because many of the people were, you know, trying to find cures or how to protect themselves and were falling for those disinformation uh, uh, treatment, uh, stories. Um, so this was the second part. Uh, I think this one was way more dangerous than the first one, geopolitical one, because the geopolitical one is political. This one concerns our security and our health. The next part that was there was the this information campaign about the scope of the pandemic. So I'm just posting two different posts from Poland and from US, but actually the other one is from around the world. So the first one you see is uh, one of the leading uh, doctors here in Poland saying presumably, uh, reportedly, that there is no virus, that there is no problem. And he was actually not saying that. His words were cut down so that it sounds that there is no virus and there is no fear. And actually what he was saying is that there is a virus, that it's not as huge as we were thinking here in Poland, but that we should take it responsibly. And he was saying how we should uh, be taking it responsibly. He was obviously not saying that the coronavirus is not there. Um, and the other one is the pandemic, so the famous YouTube and Facebook video, um, uh, which uh, goes around the world, which is also saying that it's all deep state, you know, there is a big conspiracy theory and that there is a co big conspiracy so that to depopulate the planet and that there is no coronavirus, they just want to, you know, take over your privacy, that they want to take over your lives, they want to control you, and that actually the numbers are way lower, that they are lying to us, and that all they want, you know, all, by meaning all they want is, uh, they mean uh, governments, uh, international institutions like uh, uh, World Health Organization, they just want to take over your life and they want to vaccinate you. And if they want to vaccinate you, then who appears? It's uh, George Soros and it's uh, Bill Gates because in this uh, anti-vaccination movement, they are the evil. So they appeared again in a year. And pandemic is one of those most popular narratives. This is a YouTube video that is being now and then uh, removed from YouTube and Facebook, but it reappears all the time. And it's like the leading movie uh, uh, and uh, an expert um, uh, who is saying that the pandemic does not exist. The expert actually has been denied many by many institutions, by many universities. Her previous work was also shown as uh, unreal reliable but still this movie goes all around the world and it's very very popular and there are uh, organized this information campaigns campaigns sharing spreading the movie it's being uh, it's um, partly what the research by DFR lab is showing it's partly sponsored by Russian uh, Russian uh, uh, actors uh, it's being spread on various groups, not only groups uh, dedicated to coronavirus or groups uh, dedicated to healthcare. It's also spread on groups dedicated to traveling because, you know, they do not allow you to travel because they, uh, they want you to stay locked down in your country and it's just part of this conspiracy scheme. So this is another uh, part of this information, the scope of the pandemic. For example, currently in Poland, we have a big um, disinformation or conspiracy theory actually spread around minors because minors, current, uh, minors uh, currently in Poland uh, are the group that is most affected by uh, the pandemic. We have like the big uh, spread of coronavirus in uh, coal mines. 
And what the miners are now saying is that the cor the, uh, the disinformation, uh, they, they are saying that coronavirus does not exist. It's all only because um, they want to close the coal mines. And of course, it's not true. Uh, no one is planning to close both coal mines. Uh, and uh, and uh, we're just testing a lot of, uh, we're testing a lot of coal miners and that's why the numbers for them are so high. But if you go to YouTube, if you go to Facebook, lots of that kind of conspiracy theories are there. And it's not just the Polish narrative, it's a narrative uh, all around the world. For example, currently the same situation is happening in Peru. So they are spreading this information that there is no pandemic, they just want to cut down on the, on the, um, on the mines in there. So this is the third phase of the, of the pandemic that we undermine its uh, importance. Also part of it is a narrative that um, it's uh, uh, that coronavirus is not as dangerous as for ex is less dangerous than for example typical winter flu which data is not proving because it's more uh, it's uh, the virus here is way stronger and uh, it's spreading among more more people. Uh, then the next, the fourth one, uh, yeah, so uh, those are the, I would say the, the, the three main uh, just examples of how the disinformation was spreading. So it's the Wuhan and building hatred, once again, I think this was the main building hatred and distrust and fear. Then the third one, the second one was healthcare disinformation, which was mainly focused on the fear. So the fear was already there and um, this information was uh, uh, going among people who were just scared and were searching for ways how to treat themselves and how to protect themselves. And the third part was, and this one was already a saying, the first one, the first one and this, this third one uh, type of disinformation, it focuses on organized campaigns. Um, it's the, there are actors who are doing this, and this is largely connected to um, anti-vaccination movement, anti-5G movements, uh, pro-Russian activists. Uh, so this has been already proven by testing and uh, verifying how this disinformation goes. So this is just, an, uh, uh, just a couple of examples how it looks, but what has it, what the pandemic has taught us in terms of uh, educational challenges. First of all, the scope of this pandemic and the disinformation campaigns, how large it was. So therefore the word infodemic, actually never before we had faced infodemic like this. So the, the, the usually um, disinformation campaigns are not directed at, or disinformation, not even campaigns, but just disinformation is not directed at whole societies. In this case, it's not just whole society. It's not just the Polish people. It's not just North Macedonian people. It's not just Cyprus people. It's the whole world. So each and every country is facing coronavirus and it's facing disinformation connected to this. And it's not just also specific groups of people. So for example, in Poland, we often have fake stories or fake graphics about how to treat different diseases for all the people. But this time, it's not just for all the people. Uh, of course, uh, coronavirus affects all the people mostly, um, but it's uh, uh, but this information and fake stories that uh, go around do not concern just them. So the scope of the pandemic uh, uh, showed that um, uh, uh, this information that we were thinking about was just mini disinformation. The, the times that we live now are a real test for us. But then what has also been tested in terms of educational challenges. As we have worked on uh, this project, uh, Media Lab, we, um, we're looking into how different countries are prepared uh, for media literacy education uh, uh, when it comes to schools. Uh, and we were looking into the access to internet and how it affects the media literacy. But what we did not think of, um, I think in most of countries, is that out of sudden, we all will need to do distance learning. So we, we know how to work on a computer. That's what we're teaching our kids in most of the countries, although not every country has media literacy classes, like we in Poland, we do not but we can do media literacy trainings, for example, on IT classes. So we know how to use a computer. 
we know how to do our homeworks on computers, but then when the whole educational system switched to uh, uh, just online learning, that was a huge challenge. And many countries and many schools did not pass it. So for example, in Poland, we did not have one curriculum for all the schools that could be done online. It was just uh, upon teachers, how they would approach this, how they would do their classes, and not everyone enjoyed it. So, um, so, and not every teacher was able to do it. Many kids are saying that what they did for the past three months was just getting emails from the teachers telling them what to do. They did not even have like the direct contact with the teachers other than once a week. This is not online learning. This is not digital trainings. But what we also faced during this, and this is one of the aspects I'm saying media literacy, we were teaching it to the kids and I know that we have many teachers among us, but maybe it's also, uh, it showed us that teachers are not fully digitally literate, that many skills were missing. That's why many of the teachers are not able to do the trainings online. Uh, what also, um, uh, and I know uh, that it has been uh, a case in many other countries, we call it here in Poland flooding, but in other countries, it's also called Zoom bullying, so teachers and students did not fully grasp the uh, digital security trainings before the pandemic or we have it in theory what but when we started having classes online it did not work so people were sharing uh, zoom links uh, broadly they were posting it online teachers were posting links uh, on facebook and it was a very easy way for uninvited guests to work uh, to join the trainings. So uh, we could see a lot of bullying during the classes. We have cases here in Poland when uninvited guests pretending to be students were joining uh, online classes and playing porn movies for the whole audience of the kids. So, and you know, and this is the basic trainings we are all getting about online security, but the, the basic thing uh, when it, that is connected to digital security and uh, digital literacy. And when we were tested, we just paid. So this is uh, one, of the, uh, one of the aspects that is uh, very, very uh, uh, important. Now, um, another uh, challenge that we saw during uh, the pandemic is that we saw that lots of our, of our societies are data illiterate. Uh, and, uh, and it doesn't only mean kids and it doesn't only mean, mean youth, it only means, also means grown-ups. And this information was easier to spread, especially that one concerning the scope of the pandemic, because people were unable to read data. Also, of course, we journalists were un unable very often to present it in the right way. That's also a matter of fact. It's also a matter of fact that some of the governments were not able to present it correctly uh, so that it would be understood for the societies. Uh, but we could see that people do not understand numbers, that people do not understand uh, uh, graphs that the easier the graphs are, that's the better. So we went like to the basics, that the, the, the easiest graphs worked best. But uh, as saying, since people could not uh, understand the numbers uh, properly, the disease, the, the, the disease of disinformation was spreading even more. Um, what we also observed this time was celebrity conspiracy theories or celebrities that were going very vocal about their mistrust to official data and official statements by World Health Organization and other governments. So here are just a couple of uh, celebrities. Uh, so uh, Djokovic, uh, who was not trusting the coronavirus is real and that there are too many measures taken and then it's not necessary and then got uh, sick, uh, uh, infected by himself. The lady you see here is a Polish super famous uh, singer, Edyta Górniak, who is going and taking grounds about uh, right-wing uh, media and other conspiracy theories uh, websites and talking openly about her mistress to official data and uh, under, uh, underlining that she would not allow to be uh, vaccinated if there is a vaccine for coronavirus. And she became a star of the right wing, of the hardcore right wing, so to say. 
and uh, of cons and she's like the, the goddess of conspiracy theorists, which she was not before. But this is something also we were unprepared for, that influencers, people who really have a voice, uh, would be sharing uh, disinformation to such an extent. The reason why they are doing so is that probably some of them indeed trust it. Not all of them are also well educated and digitally literate and uh, numbers literate. But for many of them, this is also a way of being on the front pages. This is not a time where they can go on stage. This is not a time where they can play, sing, um, dance, or uh, go on TV stations because many TV stations are not having guests in their studios. They cannot have concerts. They cannot play sports games. And, but they still need to be on the covers. And this is one of the ways it's controversial, but for many of them, it's working that we don't forget about it. They are very influential and their influence on, the, on our societies and on our kids is huge. So we knew that influencers have a voice. Very often we were undermining their voice and lowering it, saying that it's just the online influencer who cares about what he says. But from what we see now, people indeed do care. And I think this is a lesson for us also to, to bring celebrities, even on PowerPoint presentations to our classrooms, show their failures, show uh, uh, their fake stories, show uh, things they say against uh, knowledge and against uh, what had already been proven by scientists. We actually, um, and so th this is a very, very important part of it. I will just uh, go back to, to present it to myself. And what we have also um, uh, recently saw, we had um, a presidential election this Sunday and uh, we did a special debate for the youth, and it was only 18 year olds and 21 year olds joining it. And what they were all saying is that they even saw during presidential campaign, when it was so important not only to talk about politics, but also to keep the society calm, to keep the people less scared, to make them trust the uh, healthcare. In Poland, we have lots of people who do not trust doctors, which is like terrible during pandemic, and it's also helping disinformation spread. But what the young people were saying is that they finally want a campaign and politicians also, not only celebrities, who uh, focus on, uh, uh, who focus on, uh, uh, who focus on, uh, uh, sorry, I just looked at the chat and I got, uh, uh, and I got this connected. So just, focus on research and focus on science. That's what the young people were asking politicians for. And I think we should also bring it to our classes and show that celebrities should take care of it and we teachers and so on. Sorry, I took too much time of yours. I did not even, I had the whole screen and it was, um, it was hiding my clock. Thank you. Thank you, Beata, for bringing us to the topic we were aware and we were in this topic all this time. So we were really uh, um, uh, also listening to the radio, listening to the TV. We heard these examples and yeah, very often we, we, we ask ourselves these questions. Really? How could it be? Yes. And so the questions for media literacy is also very much important. So thank you very much for reaching up these very important topics and very important points um, in your presentation. And now, uh, I think it's a time for our discussion, for the discussion, uh, thinking about not only Beata's presentation, um, which really was very fruitful and covers lots of topics, but also about all other presentations we have heard today during uh, the conference. And before opening the discussion, I would like to say uh, very big thanks to our presenters who for our all our speakers to Melina to Nadezhda and Malgojata to, to Maria to Klinta uh, Jovana and Beata of course for your topics and for your presentations uh, today uh, and yes so now the floor is open for discussion and we can also already see in the chat some uh, moments to discuss and i would like to invite vasilis elinas uh, are you here 
because you have here you have shared here a comment and question with all of us would you like to step in with this comment and question and to present it alive Vasily Salinas okay hello I don't know if you can hear me yes we can hear you yeah I have an issue with my camera to be honest and is uh, on the laptop uh, so I prefer to write it down but since you invited me yes uh, okay i have uh, i have been following the results uh, the outcomes the constituencies and the okay the negative results and the deaths across the globe since almost the beginning here in cyprus uh, of having this uh, news on the on the top stories on, on the, uh, from uh, 17th of march and uh, okay i have seen the escalation of the of the um, people dying and uh, infections etc and then suddenly you know all the news so we, if you are watching tv or in the in the social media it was like 90 percent 80 percent of the of the news uh, uh, only dealing with this issue uh, gradually now we have seen that uh, this has been changing and uh, it's not like the world stopped to have uh, conflicts and interests, but uh, uh, obviously it was uh, reduced somehow. And, uh, but now we see again tensions uh, on trade between USA and China, for example, or in the Syria or in between Iran, etc. Uh, in the Mediterranean, that is also uh, plays interest more us here in Cyprus. So if, you see, if we see that the news agenda is coming back to pro, let's say, the, the reality, let's say, uh, before the crisis, uh, maybe this is like a, a factor, like indication, that things we are going back to normality, you know? Uh, so how the media can balance these things? If suddenly a big distraction, uh, a big uh, physical, uh, catastrophe something comes up everybody's dealing with this and we forget everything else and this is because then you leave the world and continues uh, without uh, without controlling without media doing their job this is my my question how to balance uh, prioritize the, the news thank you Vasilis and w w would it be this question to some particular speaker or it's for all speakers to discuss or if or someone feels that is more uh, um, yeah Mm -hmm. So, who would like to join uh, with some comments and answer to Vasilis' question about the, how can media balance the news and prioritize them based on the impact on the crucial mass of populations across the world? Do we can I? Yes, please. I don't think we can at this point. Maybe at some, I don't know, in the past we could because of the fact that media was controlled at least by the editors of uh, the news or uh, the editors of whatever is being shared on TV. Now with the internet, when we are the ones sharing the data, I don't think it's doable like that. I think the only solution to this is to sort of educate the audiences and then sort of let them filter information on their own. But I don't think we can actually control what's being aired in this respect. Maybe if you work um, on TV, maybe I can uh, control what I'm sharing in my show, but that's like only half an hour uh, throughout the week. Most people are online now and you cannot control uh, social media or whatever is being shared there. So. I'm sorry, but I'm pretty, um, I'm not sure about control. There should be rules, of course, uh, definitely, and regulations when it comes to media, but I don't think we can control it. I think we should move more towards a more literate audience because um, it, it's like uh, the ball is on the other side now. It's not controllable what people share. That's what I think. That's it. Thank you, Yovana, for your input. And um, do we have some more questions thinking about all the presentations today we've heard? Yes, Constantinos, please. Yes, just a comment on Vasily's question. 
I just want to note, I, I want to respond as a journalist and say that on many occasions, journalists themselves get carried away by what social media is responding to. For example, the coronavirus crisis, or in other cases, the refugee crisis, or in other cases, the election of Donald Trump. It's a case by case reaction. I think journalists should, many journalists should stop doing that. They should respond to a situation and continue to respond to it, irrespective of what the social media trend is. On many occasions, journalists tend to follow the social media trend and not create it, and not create it themselves, not be the instigators of it. They should be the instigators of it, not follow what is being said and react to it. And on many occasions, they made the mistake of following such trends, and then after a while, they began forgetting about it. For example, nobody's talking about the refugee crisis today because we have the coronavirus crisis. Tomorrow it might be a different one. Well, people are already starting to forget that in many countries because there's no lockdown, but the problems are continuing. And for example, there are problems with economic situations in, in many countries as, an out, as a result of the crisis and many businesses being closed. So I think journalists should do more not to control social media, because I agree with Giovanna, it's impossible to control such level of information, but they should be first in what they report in social media, instead of following what other people are saying. And on many occasions, these people are not well educated, they get the wrong sources of information, and they put them out there first. So journalists should be more um, concerned about that, and not just follow information, but uh, be the sources of information, the right sources of information. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, remark. Uh, Beata, please. Uh, I would say that in my presentation there was too little about journalists. I think also this time of pandemic tested us immersely and many of us failed because we also don't know how to read data and very often the maybe not fake, but not fully reliable information that was in the media was coming from the journalists who could not read numbers or who were not searching for reliable sources. Although on the other hand, I have to say that, I don't know how about your countries, but in our countries, I haven't seen uh, experts, real experts, so many real experts during, uh, uh, never before. So the pandemic time was the time of real experts. It was not politicians coming on TV talking about the healthcare and about treating coronavirus. It was finally the experts. And I think this is a lesson for us journalists to focus on scientists, focus on experts, to bring them more to the people. So they finally start trusting the researchers, uh, uh, teachers, uh, doctors, and so on. So, yes, as someone was writing here in the chat, it's time to bring the experts, and it's time also for universities to be more open to start speaking the language of the people. Because, you know, very often we as trainers, educators, especially scientists and uh, university teachers, we speak our own language, which is not easily understandable for the people. So, it's time also to to become the celebrities, you know, the scientific celebrities. What, what a great ending could be for our conference with Beata's speech. Yes, Constantinos, please. Yes, in, in connection with what Beata is saying, I completely agree. When the experts came forward, it, it's clear that on many occasions we are the instigators of false information without really wanting to. And I would really like to focus on one point that she mentioned in the presentation. This influencer thing. Uh, I think it's starting to really get on my nerves. I mean, who are these people? Most of these people don't have real education. They're just people who either dress well or rich or are actors and singers who have, on many occasions, little to do with what is happening in the real world. They're rich, they're outside um, of the situations that we are facing. And I saw during the coronavirus people describing how they lived in their big luxury mansions and how they were so uh, scared of living in these big luxury homes with swimming pools and like a hundred rooms. And I was thinking, what do you know about what people are facing with the coronavirus lockdown? And I think it's about time that we stop listening to these influencers and Instagram celebrities and follow the experts like we have to say. 
Thank I, you. So, I'm sorry. I think that a big role actually here is the, uh, should be done by culture worker, workers. So I would not call out all singers and actors bad or whatever, but I think it's very important that we focus our work on what's important when it comes to information. That's why, like I showed you in the show, we give a shout out to the journalists. We're not we're portraying them and uh, the movies that we have seen about journalists, about big stories have helped this industry a lot and helped journalism be have a better voice. For example, in my country, I know the same happens in Greece and probably everywhere else. People don't trust media and therefore they don't trust journalists. And it's very important for everybody to agree on the fact that real journalists should be trusted and also real experts as well. So I think that we should work together rather than, you know, just uh, fighting and f as much as influencers are, they will be always influencers on Instagram, etc. And these people will be always interesting. But like I said, it's important. And finally, the audiences realize that if it's a pandemic, you listen to the doctor, you don't listen to the singer or the whatever, sport, even sportists. Yes, and so working together, uh, working together and partnership between different organizations is very, very much important. And I would like to approach already the end, coming back to the project where different countries were working together uh, to deal with a media literacy issue. And uh, I would like to sum up with a question about the tools and about the products were created and we during the presentations we we had a chance to see these products and some implementation presented by teachers uh, would you have some ideas to discuss about uh, why this kind of tools is important for us yes and if it's important yes and uh, what about the input uh, of this project production to our everyday life to our everyday working life when we are working with young people when we are um, uh, trying to find the ways and trying to find the best ways how to deal with uh, uh, fake news and so on so i would like to open the discussion about this tools and products which were created under this project. Hello, may I speak a little? Yes, Thomas, please. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Good to see you. Hi, good to um, see you. I have uh, some thoughts about all of this uh, since our last meeting half, half a year ago. Uh, in fact, we have some problems with speaking about how the knowledge comes to everyone, how, how the knowledge is uh, being falsified uh, because uh, we have uh, troubles into communicating people from where we take some uh, scientific topics. You know, we, we don't teach kids at school what is peer review, what does it mean, the falsification uh, of Karl Popper? The, those are the uh, basis of our modern science. And if we lose it, uh, people can trust almost anyone, like uh, stupid influencers or musicians, other, other people, because they, uh, they don't know how the evidence has come through. Uh, why the... Uh, in press, you know, even the Guardian or the main uh, main uh, newspapers in our uh, in our countries, the knowledge is mostly reprinted from the main uh, scientific uh, newspapers, uh, magazines like Lancet, like Science or Nature, and sometimes when something goes wrong, we make it like a scandal. You know, How, last month uh, there was some. Uh, article in Lancet, which was improper in the in the uh, resource of the evidences, but it was re really quickly uh, found out by other scientists. And in newspapers, it was written like it was a scandal of science and other things, and we really kill the reliability of scientists like this way. Uh, but the falsification, all the Karl Popper's theory about science. I think this is the really good uh, set of rules that would help us uh, finding uh, about new things. And I think press should uh, really write a little more about how do evidence come, how do we 
and check evidence from some, somebody's beliefs, but uh, it, it's really too, too little of it. Uh, but I have another thing also. We met in the beginning of January this year. It was the time when the pandemic was growing on uh, in China. We've seen in, on YouTube the building hosp hospitals that were built in 10 days, uh, the statistics, and nobody talked about that this will come in here in two months. But, uh, uh, but the intelligences in our countries already did know about this. The governments were warned in USA, in uh, European Union countries, as far as we know from, from, from press and other points. Uh, and if we reverse the speaking about uh, fake news, uh, in January, in what uh, kind of press it should have been written that this will come to us within two, less than two months uh, for you to believe this. You know, when something is away from our experience, away from something that we know from our real life, uh, then we can't even trust it because it's it's not something uh, known to us. Uh, yeah. So so we missed if if we should have known in January that this will come. We've been talking only about only about lockdown, only about killing down the economic schools, uh, closing borders, but. It was just, uh, you know, 40 days before everything comes in Europe and uh, just only looking into statistics of flights, of moving through, of already known as pandemic statistics and the COVID-19 uh, facts, we should have recognized that this will come and this will uh, start in Europe very, very soon. So okay. it's thank it's, you, Thomas. Okay, thank you. Thank it's you, more thank to you, Jonathan Hyde thinking uh, of uh, or the righteous mind. You know, yeah. we're aware of something that we know, and yeah, the, yes, it's uh, it's a never-ending could be discussions, uh, and so our conference took a bit longer, but it only proves that these topics are very much important to discuss. We have. Uh, and we know what to say and we, we have something to say and it's very much important that we are discussing. So uh, at the very end, I um, uh, would like to finish today our discussion and our, our conference uh, before saying uh, goodbye. Once again, a huge thanks to all participants and some organizational information that please uh, the one who did not check Rita Bashkene email uh, you've got yesterday, please check the email, find the link with an additional questionnaire and fill in uh, the information which is really needed for the project. Um, and uh, for the very final moment, I think uh, I would like to invite the, the project organizers uh, from the National Agency uh, Simone Salomea uh, to say the final word and to say um, the final greetings to all the participants, to all the conference and to all the partners. Cooperation was very good having in the mind what kind of results do we have today. So thank you very much for participation. Dear partners, thank you for very uh, very rich, uh, very useful, uh, very interesting presentation. We present all fields of media literacy. And I think uh, as I uh, see in the comments that it's really useful for participants, it's uh, really, uh, we've done, it's done a uh, big job, job <laughs> in our project. Uh, way and uh, thanks for participants uh, which are very interested in this topic and uh, interesting was uh, uh, interesting discussions and uh, i think it media literacy topic it's uh, rise the importance is rising uh, every day and every um, every year and uh, after this project uh, this uh, topic as media literacy in all fields will be actual more and more. So thanks for participation. And uh, 
I would like to say a big thanks for Angela for moderating this, uh, this, this discussion and the conference at all. And I would like to say thanks for uh, youth agency who participating in this, uh, our conference for support, all support and for all partners and all friends of this project. Thank you very much. And we will see, I, I hope we will see each other later. Thank you very much and uh, goodbye. Thank you, thank you and goodbye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you to everyone. Amazing conference. Thank you for all. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Bye everyone. Bye. Oh, huh? Una conferencia, pero Zoom meeting.